Nothing to Ghost About, book two in the Witchwood's Funeral Home series, written by Morgana Best, narrated by Amy Soakes. Chapter One The funeral singer had vanished. It was just after six in the evening, and it was uncharacteristically hot for this time of the year. The guests were milling about in a grumpy fashion. Everyone looked depressed, but that was not surprising, given that they were at a funeral. The deceased, Alec Mason, was a middle-aged man, a well-known crime figure who had served time for organised crime of the jewellery theft variety. His untimely demise had been caused by a hit and run. At the time of the accident, he was unmarried, but had been married three times. In fact, all three of his ex-wives were in attendance. Thankfully, they were so far giving each other a wide berth. I was standing at the doorway to the viewing room, keeping an eye on my mother. She was mingling, as she put it, despite the fact that I had told her no less than seven million times that she shouldn't be mingling at a funeral. It was our job to run the event and to do our best to ease one of the many hardships on those who had recently lost someone close to them. If I did my job well, the family of the deceased should not give me a second thought, at least until the bill arrived. Yet my mother did not share my views. She said a good host should not stay on the sideline. Never mind that there was a funeral going on and not a dinner party, and never mind that my father had left the business to me. I watched as mum approached ex-wife number two. She spoke to her for a few moments before taking her by the arm and leading her over to ex-wife number one. That woman was standing close to me, so I could hear my mother plainly. Death should bring us together, she said, not drive us further apart. I sighed and hurried forward, stepping between the two ex-wives, who looked as if they were about to come to blows. I touched my mother on the shoulder lightly to get her attention. Mum, I need your help in the kitchen, I said. She turned and glared at me. Excuse me, she said to the two women who were still staring daggers at one another. She followed me out of the viewing room, across the entrance hall, and then through the dining room and into the kitchen. Every time you ask for help in the kitchen, you really want to yell at me, my mother said. I nodded. Well, very astute. Stop trying to get the ex-wives to speak to each other. You do realize this is a crime family. What if they pull out knives or guns or something? This funeral home has had enough bad publicity already. Mum glared at me. With Pastor Green being on vacation, I need to help his replacement, Pastor Morrison. I can never find that man anywhere. Anyway, Ian said he overheard one of the ex-wives express regrets. I wanted to help them overcome their regrets. I grimaced when I heard Ian's name. Ian was my mother's younger and equally religious best friend, or more of a pet, really. He followed her around, and the whole thing creeped me out. I didn't even know Ian was here. He's been avoiding you, my mother said pointedly. He thinks you would make him leave. I would make him leave, I said, trying my best not to shout. He doesn't work here. Speaking of people who actually do work here, at least for the night, I need to find the singer I ordered from the internet. I saw him setting up earlier, but now he's nowhere to be found. You know, Ian has a lovely singing voice, my mother started. I lifted my hand and cut her off. Don't. I made my escape and went to find the singer. I didn't see the man anywhere among the guests, and no one answered when I called out his name outside the restrooms. The only place I hadn't looked was upstairs. No one had been upstairs for a long time. Up there was an apartment in a state of disrepair. As soon as I had some free time, I was going to renovate it so I could move in. Living with my mother was difficult, to say the least. I went upstairs to check. Preston, are you here? I called out. A man walked around the corner. Yes, he said. Preston was here. That was a strange thing to say, but I ignored it. Excuse me, no one is supposed to come up here. We need you downstairs, we're about to begin. Right, right. He nodded gravely. I don't think I can. You don't think you can? 
I asked. I suppose the man had stage fright. I really had little sympathy. He shouldn't advertise himself as a funeral singer if he was prone to stage fright. People were counting on him. Some days everything just worked together to raise my blood pressure. I could almost feel my blood boiling in my veins. I don't think I can, he repeated sadly. No one would enjoy me. Well, you could, I guess. I must say I'm a little surprised that you're talking to me. I am new to all of this, though. You're new to this? I asked, my eyes going wide. The website said all you guys were professionals with experience. Preston did not respond, but instead stared at his hands, turning them over and then back again. I was worried that he was unwell and stepped forward. Preston, what's going on? I can't go on. I'm sorry. I simply can't. I would if I could, believe me. He continued to look at his hands and then swept one hand through the corner of the wall. I stared at his hand moving through the wall. Preston, I said softly. I would much rather go on, he said. I love to perform. Slowly, he reached down for my hands, and as I watched, his hands went right through mine. Somewhere downstairs, a woman screamed. You're a ghost? I asked breathlessly. The fact that he was a ghost meant something was wrong. The scream meant something was wrong. It meant I needed to be rushing down the stairs, but I was frozen to the spot. Preston nodded. I'm afraid so. I gasped. But you weren't when you got here, were you? Preston shook his head. Oh, no, I said. There was a break in the screaming downstairs, and then it started again. I turned and hurried away from the ghost. Downstairs was a scene of panic. People didn't know what to do. Most people were crowded into the hall, facing the restroom. I shoved my way through the crowd and found my mother by the bathroom door. She clutched at me. It's horrible. I stepped into the bathroom. There stood Ian, shrieking. I had been so sure it was a woman, but he was simply hitting a note that not many men could reach. He stopped screaming when he saw me. There's a body, he said, a dead one, and then he fainted. I stepped forward to catch him, letting him fall onto my arms before I bent and deposited him on the floor. I turned and looked. Preston Kerr, or at least his body, was on the floor. I crouched to get a closer look at the man. It looked as though there were deep bruises around his neck. Someone had strangled him, or at least it appeared that way. Two men in suits appeared by my side. We need to get everyone out of here, one of them said. Get everyone out, I parroted. I was in shock. He nodded. Yes, the police are on their way and will need to speak to everyone. He turned to address the crowd. Leave this area, but no one is to leave the premises, he said in a booming voice. I said the first thing that came to mind. The deceased man's family will be upset. He somewhat pompously crossed his arms. The fact of the matter is that he is no longer the only deceased man here. Everyone, please, we're going to have to ask you to leave, the other man said. It was obvious to me that they were detectives. As the deceased, the official deceased, that is, the man in the coffin, had been a crime figure and a murdered one at that, I had expected undercover police to come to his funeral. Now they were no longer undercover, but had taken charge. I wondered where they had been when Ian started screaming, given that I'd beaten them to the funeral singer's body. It took a few minutes to get everyone moving in the right direction, but soon the corridor outside the restroom was empty and everyone was gathered in the reception room. No one was trying to make a break for it, for which I was thankful. This place has been crazy since you came along, a disembodied voice said. I turned to see Ernie leaning against the wall. I always wondered how ghosts could sit or lean, given that they could pass through solid objects. I supposed I'd find out some day. I hoped not too soon. I nodded at him, careful to make sure I didn't look like I was communicating with thin air. Ernie liked to hang around the funeral home and hand out advice, as well as bad puns. I met him soon after returning to my hometown. 
Ernie was old and stooped, hunched over. He looked the same as he had when he died. At least I figured he did, because I didn't think a soul would choose to spend eternity hunched over like that. Ernie was here because he wasn't satisfied with his death. I had helped Tiffany, a young woman, find out who had killed her soon after I'd moved back. She had gone to the other side, whatever that might be. Ernie wasn't ready to move on, although I wasn't sure why. We had never spoken about it. I know, I said with my hand over my mouth. He's the second person to die since I've taken over the funeral home. You're supposed to take them after they die, he said, not get them killed. Yeah, yeah, I said. Did you see anything? Ernie shook his head. I wasn't around. The new fella's still inside, but I don't want to talk to him. New ghosts ask too many questions, and I'm not a people person. I'll talk to him, but I wanted to give him some time first. Who are you talking to? My mother asked as she crept up behind me. No one, I said, turning around. Mum glared at me, her lips pursed. You know, we need to have a discussion. About what? The dead body. These crazy things happening to you. Perhaps it would be best if you left this all to me. I think a demon might be following you. Ian thinks you might need deliverance. Huh? I said loudly. Tell Ian to mind his own business. I was about to say more, but the blare of sirens put a stop to that. Whatever it was that my mother wanted to say to me about demons would have to wait. Chapter 2 It was going to be a long day. I pushed my way through the crowd and went to the front door, but the two men in suits had beaten me to it. I looked between the men to see two squad cars pulling up. Duncan climbed out of the first car. Duncan was the local sergeant and was married to my best friend, Tara. The three of us had grown up together. Duncan nodded to me, but approached the two men. What happened? He asked. There's a body in the bathroom, one of the suits said in hushed tones. Murdered. My mother tut-tutted and shook her head. Why would you think something like that? He probably just passed away. You shouldn't always assume the worst. The police ignored my mother, and I found myself grateful that Ian was still passed out, so I didn't have to hear that sort of nonsense from two directions at once. It looked like he was strangled, one of the plain clothes cops said to Duncan. I'm going to start interviewing everyone. Duncan turned to me. I'll get your statement last. Let me get these people done, and we can send them on their way. I nodded. I left the police to their work and went to find John, the brother of the deceased who had organized the funeral. I'm so sorry, I said when I found John. I know how horrible this is. John shook his head. Please, this is a horrible tragedy. No one is angry with you. I think everyone can come back tomorrow for the funeral. Are you sure? Yes, I suppose the police will insist on it. It's probably not every day you're caught up in a mysterious death here, is it? I wanted to tell him that he would be surprised, but instead I shook my head. Thanks so much. Let's do tomorrow then, whatever time's best for you. I think the police are going to speak with everyone if that's okay. That's fine. I'll speak with the family and we'll do tomorrow. Same time, if that suits. Yes, absolutely, I said. I looked back at Duncan and I was surprised to see the two undercover officers were now wearing badges and interviewing people. They must have decided there was too much work for the three officers who had shown up, especially with two of them still in the bathroom with the body of the funeral singer. My mother was standing in front of me, too close for comfort. We need to discuss what's wrong with you, she said loudly. Mum, I'm not possessed, I promise, I said wearily. She made a snorting sound and crossed her arms. Why do you always twist my words, Laurel? Don't be so flippant. I didn't say you were possessed. I said there is evil around you. I rolled my eyes. That sort of stuff only happens in movies, Mum. You can blow me off, but you can't blow off true evil, she said in a raised voice. You were almost killed recently. An evil woman was drawn to you because of the evil that surrounds you. So I'm evil now, I said angrily. 
I can't keep up with this. First I'm possessed, and now I'm evil. I never said possessed, she yelled. And you aren't evil, but there is evil around you. How else could you explain it? Bad luck, I guess, I said. It was true that my life since moving back home had been a little more exciting than it had been before, and a whole lot more dangerous. Mum took a step closer to me. You should leave here and go back to Melbourne. You should leave me to run the business. I frowned. No, Mum, Dad left the business to me. I'm sorry, but you're stuck with me and the demon within. She threw up her hands in a dramatic display of exasperation. Oh, for gosh sake, Laurel, he isn't within. I did not say you were possessed, you silly girl. Just followed. Demons are attracted to immoral lifestyles. Immoral lifestyles? I asked. Yes, unmarried, drinking. Mom, I have maybe one glass of wine a week, if that. I spent all last weekend in pyjamas with kittens on the front, reading books about pirates and the girls they love. I hardly think I'm living a decadent, immoral lifestyle. Well, how would I know what you do? You never speak to me about anything. I rubbed my forehead. Okay, Mum, I'm going to go talk to Duncan. When Duncan saw me approach, he waved me over. Can you talk? He asked. What's happening with the undercover cops at the funeral? I asked him before he had a chance to speak. Duncan sighed. The deceased, and the first one, the one the funeral is for, had a criminal record. Yes, I know that, I said. The hit and run was all over TV and in the papers. Right. He was in town visiting his brother, John, who also has a pretty respectable rap sheet. Well, if that sort of thing would be called respectable. I frowned. John's a criminal too. He seems nice. Well, maybe to you, Duncan said. And the hit and run was premeditated, but keep that to yourself. The car was stolen, and eyewitnesses said the car accelerated right before it hit him. Usually people try to stop when they realize they're about to smash into someone with their car. I took a moment to process that. The news reports had not mentioned that piece of information. Now everyone knows the police were at the funeral, I said. It couldn't be helped. And besides, John, no one at the funeral has a criminal lifestyle. We ran all these guys through the system when they came to town for the funeral. Besides the deceased and John, everyone came back clean, even his other brothers. Do you think John had something to do with his brother's death? I asked. I don't know, Duncan said. I hope not, because if he did, tipping our hand made him realise we were keeping an eye on him. Just then, some people in white forensic suits wheeled out the funeral singer's body right past us. If everyone's going to be here for a while, I'd better feed them, I said. I left Duncan and went to brew pots of coffee. Just as I was filling some platters with food, Preston Kerr materialised in front of me. I'm sorry, he said. I don't know why I'm sticking around here. Do you remember anything? I asked him. He shook his head. Not really. All I can remember is that I was setting up my gear behind the curtain and someone was speaking to the dead man in the casket. Whoever it was, was apologizing for killing him. They said they had to kill him. They said there was no other way. They had to do it. Chills ran through my body. Whoever had killed Alec had killed Preston. That meant they had been at the funeral, and by all accounts, the killer was in the funeral home now. Chapter 3 I was thoroughly annoyed. Anna Stiles, a journalist from the paper in the town half an hour or so away, had just called to tell me that she was coming today. Normally, I would be happy to have the publicity, but the problem was that I already had a reporter coming to speak with me at the same time. Bob Hendry was from a big Sydney paper. Anna Stiles refused to postpone, so I had reluctantly agreed to the interview. Both reporters had said they were coming to interview me about the celebrity funerals, but I suspected they were more interested in Preston Kerr's murder. 
I spent the morning in my office, sitting in the old wheeled office chair that my father had sat in for so many years. I made considerable headway on the ever-mounting pile of paperwork, including drafting up a bill for the last funeral we had done. I had to knock some off the price, considering a man had been murdered, which caused it to be postponed, but still, it would be a nice chunk of change. I had been blissfully alone all morning. My mother was spending the day at church, no doubt trying to pray away the demon she was so sure was following me around, and she had taken Janet, the funeral home's cosmetician, with her. When my father was alive, my mother had made sure that everyone who worked for them attended her church. The only exception was old Mr. Sandalwood, Dad's accountant, and father of Basil, my current accountant. I have no idea how Dad managed to get Mum to agree to that. A ringing doorbell brought me out of my mathematics-induced stupor, and I looked at the clock my father had hung on the office wall so long ago. It was 12.20, a little too early for the reporters. I pulled open the front door to see Basil, my accountant, and also my crush. He was tall, well-built, and looked like one of those models on the cover of a romance novel. Of course, junior high girls have crushes, but sometimes Basil made me feel like a junior high girl. Is it a bad time? He asked, tucking a folder under his arm. No, not at all. Come in. It's never a bad time for you, Basil, I thought. As he stepped inside, he removed his sunglasses and slipped them inside the pocket of his suit jacket. A present for me? I asked, nodding toward the folder. Oh, yeah he said sarcastically. Monthly expenses. Do you have time to go over them? Probably. I do have two reporters due here any minute, though. He raised an eyebrow. I can come back. No, let's go ahead. Who knows when they'll actually show. We retreated into my office. Basil laid some papers in front of me after we both sat down. Your figures have improved since your mother stopped sending the funeral home's money to televangelists he said. That's good. She was furious when I changed the bank account and refused to give her the details, I said, shaking my head and then rubbing my temples. How did I get an instant headache just at the thought of my mother? Right then, the doorbell rang several times in a row. That must be one of them now. Basil slid the papers back into the folder. Whoever it is sounds insistent, hungry for a story, no doubt. I can go over the rest, I assured him, and call you with any questions. Basil shrugged. That's what I was thinking. I guess there wasn't much of a reason for me to come over here, but I have to keep earning what you're paying me somehow. I laughed. I was secretly hoping that the real reason he came over to go through the paperwork with me in person was because he wanted to see me. I certainly wanted to see him, but I had no idea if it was reciprocated. Basil was a hard man to read, harder than most. Then there was the fact that he was hiding something, or so I thought. He always smelt of white sage, and I still suspected he was able to see ghosts. Of course, that could all just be my overactive imagination. Basil followed me to the door, which made me hope I had brushed the back of my hair properly. What if there was a big bird's nest of knots in it? I hadn't been sleeping well lately. Basil waited to the side while I opened the door. I took an immediate dislike to the woman standing there. She was about my age, or perhaps a little older. She had long, blonde hair. Sure, I did too, but while mine was thick and had a mind of its own, hers was sleek and well-groomed. Perhaps I would have to invest in a straightener after all. Her heels were impossibly high, her legs impossibly shapely and long, and her dress way too tight. Her jewellery was as loud as it was fake. She was wearing so much fruity citrus perfume that it was enough to turn me off eating oranges forever. I remembered seeing her, or rather smelling her, at the funeral. She extended a slim hand to me. Laurel Bay? I nodded. Yes? Anna Stiles, she said, with the paper. Of course, there were a million papers, but she seemed self-assured enough to assume her paper was the paper. I shook her hand. Her handshake was limp, despite the fact that she was muscle-bound. 
the woman must spend half her life in the gym. My first impression of her wasn't a good one. Was I envious? Most likely, but there was something about her that revved my feminine intuition into an overdrive of red flags. And then she saw Basil, and I knew for sure that I didn't like her. An unmistakable attraction flashed across her features. I glanced at Basil. My stomach knotted, as it seemed to me that he was attracted to her as well. She was a good-looking woman, so of course the average man would be attracted to her. It's just that I really wanted Basil to be anything but the average man. She stepped toward him and offered her hand, again in a limp fashion, but this time upside down, as if she wanted him to kiss it. Thankfully, he did not. Do you work here? She asked. Her voice was almost a purr. Not exactly. Basil smiled at her. I was pretty sure he had never smiled like that at me, and I was wondering exactly what that meant. I'm the accountant. For the funeral home, Anna asked. They still hadn't removed their hands from one another's. I wanted to reach out and slap them apart. Ms. Bay is a client of mine, as are other local small business owners, Basil said. Finally, after what seemed to me to be an age, they released their grip. Anna smiled and opened her mouth to speak, but was forestalled by another car screeching to a stop. A man got out and wasted no time hurrying to the door. Bob Hendry, he announced. I need to get going, Basil said, nodding to Anna. Bob stepped inside so Basil could exit. I shut the door behind him. Mr. Hendry, this is Anna Stiles from the local paper, I said. I'm sorry that you've both arrived at the same time. It's quite all right. The look on Bob Hendry's face showed that he considered it to be anything but all right. Let's all sit down and talk, Anna suggested, her voice dripping with charm. She laid her hand on Bob's arm. Bob smiled at her, and I resisted the urge to roll my eyes. I showed them into my office, and they whipped out digital recorders in unison. Bob placed a yellow legal pad on his crossed knee and waved his pen over it. Anna looked around the room with narrowed eyes. First, the talk was about celebrity funerals and how I had come to run the place. I was surprised that they were asking me the very same questions that the journalists had asked me right after the kiss funeral, almost word for word. I was relieved that they weren't asking me about the funeral singer's murder, or, for that matter, anything about the funeral of the hit-and-run crime lord victim, Alec Mason. My relief was short-lived. Tell us about the funeral singer, Anna said imperiously. Yes, the murder victim, Bob said with relish. She smiled at him. I'll email you the link to his website. Do you have a card? He pulled out his card and handed it to her. Their hands lingered a little too long on each other's. I sighed. She sure had the whole feminine wiles thing down pat. You'd have to ask the police, I said. Anna leant forward. But didn't you find the body? No, it was... I managed to catch myself. I had nearly blurted out Ian's name. There were undercover police at Alec Mason's funeral, I said, silently congratulating myself. And they found the body, as far as I know. I was upstairs at the time. Did the police happen to mention anything about Alec Mason? Bob asked, now on the edge of his seat. Do they have any idea who murdered him? And what about Preston Kerr? Do the police have any ideas why he was murdered? Do they have any leads? I shook my head. If the police do know anything they haven't told me. I did not like the direction in which the conversation was going. Preston Kerr, the recently murdered funeral singer, appeared in the corner. He could barely hold his form. His face looked like clouds or wisps of smoke, and he faded in and out, shimmering all the while. He was the least substantial ghost I had ever seen. Ernie materialized and floated beside Preston. Don't worry about him, he said to me, pointing to Preston. He's taking it hard. You know these theatrical types. They make a big shong and dance about being murdered, he snickered. Well, surely you know something, Anna pressed. You have had two people murdered here in a short space of time.
They're dying to know. Ernie floated over to Anna just to annoy me. I glared at him. He knew that floating creeped me out. Anna looked behind her. What are you looking at? I thought I heard someone outside, I said untruthfully. I could hardly tell the annoying journalist that I was staring at a bothersome ghost who loved to make puns at every opportunity. Tell us about the girl who was murdered here recently, Bob said. Tiffany Hunter. I stood up. No, I said firmly. No, Anna asked. Look, we're just trying to get a story here, Bob said. I crossed my arms. You both told me you were coming to speak about the celebrity funerals. You didn't say a word about doing a story about the murders. You have to admit a funeral home with two murders is a much better story, don't you think? Anna asked in a sugary tone. I shook my head. I'll have to ask you to leave if you want to ask me about the murders. That's a matter for the police. I really don't know anything. Hey now, Bob said as he stood. You should work with us and help us out. It will kill your business if people think they aren't safe here. I glared at Bob. Are you threatening me? Not at all, he said in a far from convincing tone. I'm sorry you wouldn't agree to the interview. He turned away with a scowl and Anna scurried out the door after him, closing it behind her a little too loudly. It was with some difficulty that I resisted the urge to throw something at the door. I sat back down in the chair. I handled that badly, I said to Ernie. And please land. You know that floating makes me nervous. Ernie landed in front of me. You just need something to lift your spirits, I groaned. That's not funny. Ernie seemed to think it was because he laughed for some time before turning serious. You know, it really doesn't look good for Witchwood's funeral home that two people have been murdered in a short space of time. I shrugged. Well, there's nothing I can do about it. Yes, there is, Ernie said smugly. You can solve the murder. I snorted rudely. Hello, that's what the police are for. Time is of the essence, Ernie said. Those reporters will give you bad press, then people will stop coming here. No doubt the police will solve it in their own sweet time, but by then you mightn't have any customers left. They'll all be going to that new funeral home franchise in Tamworth and their stiff competition. Get it? Stiff competition? I rolled my eyes. Chapter 4 Could the day get any worse? I was forced into having dinner with my mother. That in itself would be horrible, but tonight Ian would be joining us. I really would have to look into renovating the apartment above the funeral home so I could move in. It was difficult, and that's an understatement, staying with my mother in her home adjacent to the funeral home property. I was living in my old room and paying mum board. The pungent scent of lasagna floated up the stairs and into my room. I'm a vegetarian, but I could guarantee that my mother had meat in her lasagna. She always cooked dishes with meat in it. Now that was her business, but she always acted hurt when we were eating together because I always prepared a vegetarian meal for myself. It always caused a drama, and as we ate together most nights, that was a guaranteed daily drama and one I could well do without. I reluctantly dragged myself down the stairs to find Mum and her bestie Ian in the kitchen. They were laughing and drinking sparkling mineral water from wine glasses, as children do. There she is, Mum said in her shrill voice when I walked in. Have you been sleeping all day again, dear? Ian asked. I wasn't sleeping, I said, and stop calling me dear. I'm not your dear, and you're not much older than I am. In fact, I never sleep all day. I work hard. Ian wagged a finger at me. That's not what your mother said. You spend so much time in your room that I get worried about you, my mother said. I think you're sleeping because you drink too much. Mom, I hardly drink, I said. I needed to change the conversation quickly. Do you realize that you're drinking out of wine glasses? Mum slammed her glass down hard on the countertop, causing water to spray out all over the place. 
Of course they're not wine glasses. How could you say such a thing, Laurel? Why do you always try to upset me? I bought them today because they look nice. Why, I've never let the demon alcohol get a hold of me. I signed the temperance pledge when I was seven years old. I shrugged. Okay, is dinner ready? Almost. Is there meat in it? Of course there's meat in it, Laurel. I already told you that it's lasagna. It was your favorite when you were little. I ate meat when I was little. I don't now. Mum glared at me. There's not much meat in it. You can take it out. I saw Ian open his mouth. I fought the urge to leap across the kitchen and shove him out the window before he could speak. Not eating meat is why you're so skinny, he said. It's not healthy. God made animals for us to eat, my mother said waspishly. Is that so? I said, digging my fingernails into my palm to divert me from saying something else. Of course, we rule the animal kingdom. Animals are tools to be used by us. We eat a lot of animals, lambs, pigs, cows, and even ocean animals like fish. You do, but I don't, I said. I don't share your views. Which views? Ian asked. All of them, I said. Ian shoved a finger in the air. The point we're getting at, Laurel, and this is from two people who care about you, is that you need to eat meat to be healthy. I don't, Ian, not at all. With that, I turned and headed to the dining room. I sat and took deep, slow breaths. When Mum and Ian brought in the dishes, I put salad on my plate and nothing else. Mum watched me and shook her head. Ian spoke up once more. You're not getting any protein, he protested. Ian, thank you for your concern, but plants actually have protein, I said through gritted teeth. The rest of the course was passed in merciful silence, and then Mum produced dessert. Angel food cake, Mum announced. Ian made it. I brought it, Ian said. My girlfriend made it. If only you would learn to cook, Mum said to me. Then you might be able to find a nice man like John Jones. The two of you would be a good match, don't you think so, Ian? Ian looked torn. Well, only if Laurel attends our church first, Thelma, he said. Mum looked horror-stricken. Of course, Ian, that's what I meant. And Laurel would have to learn to cook first. Or what else would she have to offer a good man like John Jones? I got through the rest of dinner by imagining myself alone on a deserted island. And then I imagined that Ian was a bartender who had to wait on me and bring me drinks. And I liked that even better. Of course, in my imagination, he had a sock in his mouth so he couldn't speak. After dinner, I offered to brew coffee for everyone and I hurried into the kitchen to escape. Ernie was waiting for me. How do you put up with your mother? He asked me. No idea, I said. Really, none. It's horrible, isn't it? He nodded. How's the new guy holding up? I asked. Not too well, he said. He's a nice guy, but he's still in that first stage. First stage? I asked. He's still in shock. He can't believe he's dead. With that, he floated up and away through the ceiling and wall. I edged toward the door as the coffee brewed, so I could hear what Ian and my mother were talking about. Thelma, Ian said, I don't know what to do with my girlfriend. Are you still having problems? My mother asked. Does she still want candles in the room when you know one another? Yes, and something new too, Ian said tersely. It's much worse than the candles now. What is it? Not something else new age, surely? Mum's voice was horrified. Even worse, Ian said. She wants to be more adventurous. I thought I would pass out. Imagine Ian saying such a thing to my mother. That's not for a woman to decide, my mother said firmly. I knew that Mum had absolutely no idea what Ian was talking about. He was still speaking in the world of knowing one another which to my overly religious mother meant lying with someone in the biblical sense, to put it in another nice term no one uses these days besides those two. I was pretty sure that to my mother, 
Being adventurous meant that Ian's girlfriend wanted to climb a mountain or run with the bulls. I know, Ian exclaimed in a self-righteous tone. That's for a man to decide, Mum continued. If he wants to take on adventures and wishes for her to do the same, then it's one thing. I tried explaining that to her, Ian said. In all things, a woman is supposed to support a man and submit to him. I don't know what's wrong with being normal. I don't need adventure. Certainly not, my mother said. A good man like you. Who knows what she even has in mind? You don't need things like animals being involved. That could be dangerous. Animals, Ian said in horror. I jammed my hands over my mouth so they wouldn't hear me laughing. I was still standing behind the door between the kitchen and the dining room. I didn't want them to find out I was listening in. Sure, animals, why not? My mother said. I don't think she would go that far, Ian protested. Something like a Tasmanian tiger, Mum said. That would be adventurous. A Tasmanian tiger? Ian's voice was barely a squeak. Who knows? Adventurous. I don't even like the word. In the water, in the air, who knows? I didn't even think of all this, Ian said weakly. You had better consider it, Mum said. I heard her chair scrape on the hardwood floor as she pushed it back and stood. I better check and see what's going on with my lazy daughter. Coffee isn't that hard to make. I hurried to the machine and pulled the full pot out from under it. I was pouring the first cup when Mum came in. Laurel, what's taking you so long? She asked. Sorry, I said, still giggling. We filled three cups together and went back out. Now here's an adventurous one, my mother said to Ian. I snorted a quick bark of laughter. Ian's face went white. She is. Oh, yes, Mum says. Very. She knows I don't approve at all, but that's never stopped her. What? You know that she is? Ian asked. Of course. When she was younger and had her friends over, she was up late at night being adventurous. I don't think she knows this, but I could hear it from my bedroom. This and that all over the room, on the bed and then off the bed, trying to climb the wall. It never ended. Ian stared at me in shock. I didn't know. Oh yes, I'm quite adventurous, Ian, I said. No boring stuff for me. Of course, I knew that Mum was referring to the time I had friends over and we rehearsed for a school play, but Ian had an entirely different idea. One time she went out into the bush to be adventurous, Mum said. Ian's mouth fell open. In the bush? You don't mean outside? Well, of course, my mother said. I got leaves everywhere, I told Ian. Ian jumped to his feet. Thank you for dinner, he said suddenly. I have to go. My mother and I watched as Ian hurried toward the front door. What's got into him? My mother asked. I shrugged. I think he heard the call for adventure. Chapter 5 I sat staring at the Sydney paper, at the article by Bob Hendry, to be precise. He had mentioned the celebrity funerals only in passing. The whole piece was a sensationalist thriller expose about the fact that there had been two murders at the funeral home. As Sydney was a good six hours drive away and had several major newspapers, I thought that the story would not filter down to which woods. I was wrong. The phone rang. Witchwood's funeral home? A voice snapped. Yes, I said. This is Henrietta McCourt. We had a wake book for Thursday. Yes, Mrs. McCourt, I said. I'm sorry, but I have to cancel. I've decided to go elsewhere. I took a deep breath. Could you tell me why? There was a lengthy silence on the other end of the phone, and I thought for a minute she had hung up. After an interval, she spoke. People get murdered at your funeral home, so I didn't want the wake to be at such an unsavory place. I sighed. I understand, I said. She hung up before I finished speaking. I reached forward to open my email. There was an email from the reporter, Bob Hendry. Here's the piece we're running today, 
was all it said, along with a link to a Word document. I slammed the laptop shut in anger right as another phone call came through. This time it was Mr. Holland calling to cancel his great aunt Harriet's funeral. That one was booked for the following day. I closed my eyes and leant back in the old chair. When I opened my eyes, I saw my mother standing in the doorway of the office. She didn't look happy. So you've heard, I asked. She stormed forward and stood on the other side of the desk, her hands on her hips. How embarrassing. How could you do this? Me, I shrieked. It's hardly my fault. Two people have died here. There's not much I can do about the story. No one died here until you came back home, she said. Has anyone cancelled yet? Two people have already cancelled, I said, just as the phone rang. And there's the third. I took a deep breath and answered the phone. My mother stood and watched and listened as Rebecca Chambers cancelled her father's service later in the week. I hung up. What are you going to do to fix this? My mother snapped at me. I don't know. It's just one story. It will die down. My mother rolled her eyes and shook her head. That's not what I meant, she said. What are you going to do about your life? Is this really what you want to talk about right now? I asked. Yes, she said. Laurel, you need to come to my church and think and pray about it. No, I said. I have work to do. My mother huffed. She took a deep breath and then basically spat it out. Fine, she said. I'll go and think and pray for you, since you won't think and pray for yourself. I watched her go and then pinched the top of my nose, my eyes tightly closed. When I opened my eyes, I gasped to see an apparition in front of me. It was Preston Kerr, still smoky and hard to see. He looked sad. I kept thinking it was all a dream or something, but I don't think it is. I don't think there's any waking up from this. I shook my head. I'm afraid not. Ernie says I will move on when I'm happy. I don't know if happy is the right word for it, I said, but people only stay here if they have unfinished business. That makes sense, Preston said. Sometimes I feel something pulling at me. I nodded. But you don't go because you need to know what happened to you? Yes. I want to know too, I said. I don't want to sound selfish or self-serving, but I can't let people think that the funeral home is a dangerous place. People need to know that what happened to you has nothing to do with the funeral home as such. I understand, Preston said. So you don't think it was anyone you know? No, I don't think so. It was whoever killed that other man, the man the funeral was for, the man in the coffin. Preston vanished and then at once materialized again. How come you can hear me and see me? No one else can. I've tried to speak to people, but they don't know I'm there. The daughters in every second generation in my mother's family can see and speak to ghosts, I said. I don't have a clue how or why. Preston nodded and then floated through the office wall. As soon as he left, the phone rang. I almost threw it to see if it would go through the wall too. Chapter 6 I hate clowns. In fact, I am terrified of them. Their oversized shoes, their red noses and crazy hair, and worst of all, their painted faces with the fake smiles. The town morgue had brought over the corpse. Janet arrived shortly after that. Janet, the funeral home's cosmetician, made the bodies presentable, and she was about as cheery as you would expect a woman like that to be. She was nice enough, although she was maxed out as far as social awkwardness went. It's going to be a late night, boss, Janet said as I let her into my office. She held up her large cup of coffee. I would have brought you one, but I don't think of you often. It's fine, I said, hiding a smile at Janet's words. This will be our first clown funeral. I shuddered and rubbed my arms. The deceased is Lynette Smith, and the client is her daughter, Daisy. Daisy and her mother were in business together as professional clowns. I shuddered again. 
Daisy has supplied some photos so you can see how the clown makeup is supposed to look. Anyway, they're all in the folder. Janet nodded. I handed her the paperwork. I'm wrapping up for the day. Will you lock up when you leave? Sure. She headed to the door and then looked back at me with a wide smile. I'm looking forward to seeing my finished work. A corpse in full clown face paint. Her tone was gleeful. I stared after the departing Janet. The very last thing I wanted to see was, in fact, a corpse in full clown face paint. I was sure I'd have nightmares all night. I locked up and went outside to see the sheep, Arthur and Martha. I have a five-acre paddock next to the funeral home, and Basil boarded his two pet sheep there. That suited me fine, for two reasons. One, I didn't have to pay to have the whole thing mowed, an expensive proposition given the area. And two, Basil frequently dropped by to visit his sheep. Hi there, Arthur and Martha, I said to the sheep. The sheep looked up from their grazing and bounded over to me, baaing loudly. They expected to be fed every time they saw me. The reason for that was likely because I did feed them every time they saw me. Here you go, I said, holding out two pieces of apple. Thank you, a voice said. I shrieked and then realized the voice was Basil's, not a sheep speaking to me. I spun around. Basil's amusement over my reaction was brief, and he wasted no time coming to the point. I saw the article, he said. It was a disaster. I grimaced. That's for sure. Well, I've been thinking about Anna Stiles, he said. My heart sank. Oh, her, I said, unable to keep the obvious distaste from peppering my voice. Basil did not appear to notice my attitude as he leaned over the fence to pat Arthur, who butted Martha out of the way and nuzzled Basil's hand, looking for apples. Did anyone cancel? I nodded. Yes, sadly, all but one. Please tell me the clown funeral is the one still on. I sighed. You're in luck. That's perfect, Basil said. I'm guessing you're the only funeral home that's willing to do a clown funeral. Others frown upon that sort of stuff. He had a point. I wondered if Daisy had tried to book her mother's funeral somewhere else, but couldn't find anyone willing to paint her face as a clown before they buried her. So I have one funeral and a whole bunch of cancellations. What's that have to do with Anna Stiles? I asked. Basil stopped patting the sheep and turned to face me. You need her on your side. A good local article would help you. I bit my lip. I don't think she's going to write anything good. She was more interested in the murders than Bob Hendry was. Well, give her a reason to write something good. Invite her to the clown funeral. People leave this place loving you and your mother. Basil, I don't think they leave this place loving my mother, I said with a laugh. Okay, so that's a bit of a stretch, Basil admitted. I was trying to be nice, but people do come away loving you. I wondered if Basil ever came away loving me. What sort of effect did I have on the man who had such a strong effect on me? Basil was still speaking. It couldn't hurt. It could hurt if she writes a bad article, though, I pointed out. Basil looked thoughtful. I could call her for you if you want. I was taken aback. You have her number? She called me after she left here last week. She wanted to make sure I couldn't give her any more information for her story. Don't worry, I was tight-lipped. I sighed. No, I can call her. I'll do it now. All right then, Basil said. Good luck. Thanks. I left Basil with his sheep and walked over to the rose garden at the front of the funeral home. I bent over and inhaled the heavenly fragrance of a beautiful butter gold rose with a licorice spice scent. I loved old-fashioned blooms. I liked to spend my spare time tending to the rose garden, not that it had many weeds. After Dad died, Mum paid a man from her church to weed the garden every Saturday. He was expensive, and he was hopeless. The gardener, and I use the term loosely, could not tell the difference between flowers and weeds. As a result, he had pulled out all the irises, daisies, peonies, and goodness knows what else from the garden. Only the roses remained. I figured that was because they had thorns. Of course, there was no point saying anything to my mother. It would only make her mad, 
and there was no way she would fire the man. I had missed being close to flowers and trees when I lived in my apartment in Melbourne. Sure, there were parks everywhere, but there were no flower beds on the inner city streets. My eyes fell on the yellow roses tag, soul mate. I thought of Basil, and that reminded me to call the journalist. I pulled my phone out of my jeans pocket. Anna Stiles, she snapped. Hi, it's Laurel Bay from Witchwood's funeral home. Bob Henry beat me to the punch, didn't he? Anna said smugly. Well, I don't want any more punches, I said. I wanted to invite you over tomorrow. We have a clown funeral, so you could see one of our unusual funerals. Your place during a funeral, Anna said with a chuckle. I had better bring my bulletproof vest. It's been a stabbing and a strangling, I said grimly. I don't think a bulletproof vest would help you. Anna laughed. I'll be there, she said. What time? One, I said. I had a bad feeling. I knew something would go wrong. Chapter 7 That's not funny, Tara. I recoiled from the object in my best friend's hand. It was an iced sugar cookie wrapped in shiny clear cellophane and tied with a tangle of tightly curled blue and yellow ribbons. It would have been cute, but for the fact that it was a grinning clown head. Tara offered the sugary disembodied head to me. Come on, it was right there at the coffee shop begging to be bought. Why do people like clowns? I wailed. They're the stuff of nightmares. Like the one I had last night, I added silently, where the clown jumped out of his coffin and dragged me away, all the while laughing with that awful clown cackle. They really freak you out, don't they? I nodded. Yes, and now I have to do a funeral for one. And did you ever see It, the movie? I couldn't sleep for a month after that. Nevertheless, to avoid hurting Tara's feelings, I took the thing and quickly shoved it into my purse to be buried with the countless receipts and enough change to sink a battleship. I tried to shake it off. It was going to be a busy few days with the clown funeral and my attempts to rebuild the home's reputation. I couldn't see how Anna Stiles was going to help, but I deferred to Basil's judgment on that. I could not think of a single reason that the woman would write anything positive about the clown funeral. I could, however, think of a dozen or so horrible headlines she could come up with. So how are things going? Tara asked me. As well as they can, I guess. I'll be glad when it's all behind me. I can imagine. When it rains, it pours, huh? Tara stopped to check herself in the reflection of a window, puckering her lips. Clowns and murders. You can't make that kind of stuff up. I had to smile. Since I had moved back to Witch Woods, my life had been far from dull. You know what you need? Therapy, I ventured. Chocolate and a good movie. How about we see a movie sometime soon? I turned to Tara. What movie is it? Gosh, Laurel, you have been gone for a long time. It's a twin cinema now, has been for years. They have about eight movies going, all at different times, obviously. She stopped and opened the door to the restaurant for me. I was a little tempted. It does sound like fun. Truth be told, I was turning into a bit of a recluse, working seven days a week and worrying about the business. No sooner had I sat down than I caught sight of a familiar face, or rather, profile. Anna Stiles, the supermodel journalist. I could smell her perfume from where I was sitting. It was the citrus one again. As the smell of limes, oranges and lemons wafted over to me, I wondered what she was doing here. I looked at her companion and my stomach fell. Basil. A pang of jealousy hit me as I studied the two. They did make a handsome couple. They were paying close attention to each other, deeply engrossed in conversation. I had a strong feeling that they weren't discussing deductions and net worth inventories. Tara, can we leave? No, we have reservations. Why, what's wrong? Tara looked behind her. Oh, it's Basil Sandalwood, your crush. And he's with another woman, she said in hushed tones. He's not my crush. Oh, okay, so he is. Tara, stop looking. 
I said, as she looked over her shoulder once more. Tara turned back to me. Why is Basil having dinner with that woman? Silly question, I said. What man wouldn't want to have dinner with that woman? Do you know who she is? I nodded. Yes, she's Anna Stiles, the journalist I told you about. She's the one who's coming to do a story on the clown funeral. Tara patted my hand. Don't worry, Laurel, it's probably a business meeting. Oh, sure, I said sarcastically. She's interviewing him about the latest exciting tax laws. Can't we just leave and go to that little Italian place down the road? No, Tara whispered. He's probably seen you. It won't look good if we leave. Seriously, don't be upset. You really don't know for sure that they're on a date. I smiled and nodded. I didn't want to ruin Tara's night just because I was melancholy. Why was I letting it get to me like this? It wasn't as if Basil and I were an item. He had never asked me out, and he'd had plenty of opportunity to do so. So what if he went on a date? Still, my stomach remained clenched, and by the time the waitress came to take our orders, I had lost my appetite. I munched on my tomato pasta and listened to Tara tell me about the murder case. So your husband really doesn't know anything, I said in disbelief. Tara nodded. Those detectives don't like to tell the local cops much. They're keeping Duncan in the dark. Duncan says it's obviously related to the murdered man, the criminal, not the funeral singer. The detectives did tell him that they can't find a connection between the funeral singer and Alec Mason. Yes, and like I told you on the phone, the funeral singer was murdered because he overheard the killer speaking to the corpse. Tara was the only person who knew I could speak to ghosts, given that we had been friends ever since we were young children. Well, my mother did too, but she was in denial, strong denial. Tara set down her wine glass and sighed. If only I could tell Duncan for all the good that would do. I don't keep anything from him apart from the fact that you see ghosts, she chuckled. Her chuckle was drowned out by raucous loud laughter. I looked up to see Anna Stiles throw her head back and laugh like a hyena. I have never heard a hyena, but I imagined that's how one would sound. A hyena or a thousand kookaburras on steroids. I averted my eyes and stared at my fork. It was silly of me to have a crush on Basil, but it wasn't as if I had made a conscious decision to do so. Somehow I managed to muddle through the rest of the night, but it was hard, given the spectacle right before my eyes. I shook my head at myself as I started for home. Tara had offered to drive me, but I sorely needed a good walk to clear my head. Of course, all I could think about was Basil. Anna Stiles was attractive, successful, and had that tough-as-nails attitude that seemed to turn men into puddles at her Prada-heeled feet. It was disappointing to see Basil fall for the siren song, but what could I do against someone like that? What are you doing? A masculine voice demanded. I whirled around. There was Basil standing behind me. Didn't you hear me calling out? He said. I'm sorry, Basil. I was lost in thought. I guiltily hoped that he couldn't guess that he was the subject of my thoughts. I was just walking home. So lost in thought that you're walking home after dark, with a killer on the loose. Basil raised his eyebrows. One who used your funeral home as a crime scene. When he put it that way, it did make my walk seem a lot less rational. I suppressed a sigh. And to think that the walk was supposed to help me relax. Just thinking of the murderer being out there in the dark made me want to sprint for home. I'm a big girl. I can handle myself, I said lamely. I hoped I sounded convincing. How about I drive you home? He waved a hand towards his car. I tried to peer through the windows. I wouldn't want to interrupt your date, I said uneasily. I wondered what was a worse fate, being attacked on the way home by a killer or being stuck in a car with Anna. What date? Basil looked over his shoulder. I bit my bottom lip. Why did I mention the date? Now he'd know I had seen him earlier. Although come to think of it, what did it matter if I saw him? It was a public restaurant after all. Basil was still waiting for an answer. Date, he said again. I was at the restaurant with Tara, I said, squaring my shoulders. 
You and Anna seem to be having a nice time. I could feel my blood pressure shoot up, even as the words were leaving my mouth. To my surprise, he broke into a short laugh. You have an odd idea of what a nice time is, Laurel. His tone was terse. He did not elaborate as he gestured a second time at the car. Let me sleep easy tonight. It will only take a minute or two to get you home safely. Had I been mistaken about Anna? No, they had definitely been having dinner together, complete with engaging conversation and kookaburra laughter. I nodded. Thanks. I could hardly refuse the offer, although part of me wanted to do so. So what brought you out tonight? Basil asked conversationally as he started the engine. Tara and I were having dinner together. I had already told him that, so I wasn't sure what he meant. Perhaps he was making idle conversation, unlike the intense conversation he had been having with Anna earlier. I see. I half hoped that he would say more, but he fell silent beside me. So, um, what were you up to tonight? I asked him. Not much. It was a short drive, thankfully, given the lack of conversation. Thanks, Basil. He cut the engine and hopped out. I'll walk you to the house. I was going to say that there was no need, but then again, the funeral home was a generous stone's throw from my mother's house, and it was a dark night. There were usually plenty of stars to be seen in the country, but tonight clouds obstructed both stars and moon. Plus, Mum had not paid her church friend to do any gardening at her house, so there was still plenty of shrubs left, shrubs behind which any manner of killer could hide. I shuddered. When we were almost at the door, my heel caught in the pavement and I flew forward. The world wobbled and tilted sideways. A hand seized my elbow, sending an electric jolt up my arm. My forward momentum was strong and the heel was still firmly lodged. I clung to Basil's arm as I did my best to free my heel. When I did so, I landed hard against his chest. I'm sorry, thanks for catching me. I was embarrassed because Basil was still holding me. Should I pull away? He leant forward, pressing his lips gently against mine. His kiss was soft and hesitant at first. It quickly became hungrier, more insistent, as he ran a hand gently down my spine. His other arm crushed me to him, as if he were half afraid that I would disappear if he relaxed his grip. Every nerve in my body was suddenly alive as I fell into his kiss. I curled my fingers gently into the lapels of his jacket. Everything about the night washed away from my mind. There was only that moment, that kiss. I hoped it would never end. And then, without warning, he pushed me away from him. This is wrong. He shook his head and raked a hand through his hair. I'm sorry, that should never have happened. I don't know what I was thinking. I stared at him in confusion. I could still taste his kiss on my lips. We can't be together, he announced. Laurel, I'm sorry, I... Good night, Basil, I said with as much dignity as I could muster. I unlocked the door quickly, went inside, shut it firmly behind me. I leant against the door until I heard him drive away. Tears rolled down my cheeks. If he didn't want me, why would he kiss me like that? Because the person he really wanted to kiss ditched him after dinner, an ugly, dark little voice nagged at the back of my mind. I should have driven home with Tara, or walked, or jumped off a bridge. Chapter 8 I walked down the long corridor to the cosmetician's room, not looking forward to seeing Janet's work. Usually, I was impressed to see what Janet could do with a body. She was certainly one of the best in the business, a master at making the deceased look as if they were simply sleeping. Yet there was nothing tasteful about the funeral that was to take place that day. Lynette had been a clown, and her daughter Daisy, who was also a clown, I shuddered at the thought, had instructed Witchwood's funeral home to bury the deceased in her clown makeup. Mum, needless to say, had been angry when I accepted the request, but as most of our recently booked funerals had cancelled, we needed this clown funeral. 
While I disliked clowns purely because they scared me, my mother saw them as an affront to God. Of course, she could see most things as an affront to God if she was really trying. And unfortunately, she was almost always really trying. Janet stopped by the casket, which was mercifully closed, but then she lifted the lid. This was one of the better jobs I've had, she said cheerfully. I'm not exactly happy that she bit it or anything, but I guess I sort of am. This was fun. I wish everyone got painted up like a clown. Why not? You just worm food when you die. Your body, at least. God takes the soul, and the worms get the flesh. It was a chilling thought. Sometimes I forgot that Janet was religious. She went to my mother's church, as did just about everyone else my father had ever hired. I was looking forward to the day when I could hire the first atheist who filled out an application, if only to spite my mother. If I could find a Satanist, that would be even better. I laughed at the thought. You're so strange, Janet said. Why did you laugh for no reason? Without waiting for me to answer, she pushed on. This corpse looks amazing. If only she could see herself. I had to admit that Lynette did look good. It's just that looking good meant she gave me the heebie-jeebies. Her face was white, her lips red, and the paint stretched on far past her natural lips. She had purple diamonds around her eyes, and Janet had even put her bright red wig upon her head. She looks great, I said with a shudder, reaching forward and quickly pushing down the lid to the casket. Let's get her out there. I still need to finish the food. All right, Janet said in a bored voice. When she wasn't being shockingly inappropriate or shockingly rude, Janet sounded shockingly bored. We pushed the casket along in silence. When we reached the viewing room, Mum burst through the door and hurried over to lift the lid. I've thought you have gone too far before, but this is it, she exclaimed. It's an abomination. God will surely strike us down. I don't think he will, Janet said. I was shocked. I was pretty sure I had never heard her speak to my mother. Who doesn't love a clown? I'm telling you both that God hates clowns, my mother said firmly. Why would you possibly think God hates clowns? I asked, puzzled. It says so in the Bible, Mum explained slowly, as if Janet and I were stupid. I tried not to roll my eyes. The Bible says that God doesn't like clowns. I didn't even think there were clowns back in those days. And it shall come to pass that I will punish all such as are clothed with strange apparel, she said, surely quoting a book of the Bible, just as surely as I had no idea which one. Did Jesus actually say that? I asked. Mum shot me an angry look. Jesus wasn't in the Old Testament, which you would know if you ever came to church. But I think Jesus would agree with what his father God said. One should agree with everything their father said, even if you knew he was wrong. I tried to get my head around that one and failed. Are you saying God was wrong in saying that strange apparel wearers should be punished? For once I wasn't being sarcastic. I actually wanted to know. Mum's face went white and she clutched at her throat. I thought she might pass out. No, Laurel, she screeched angrily. Why do you always twist my words, you horrible heathen child? Do you know you took three days to be born and I knew you were going to cause me trouble? Why, I went to the bathroom and a lady asked me whether I'd had a boy or a girl. I was so embarrassed to say that I hadn't had the baby yet. You caused me trouble then and you're causing me trouble now. I rolled my eyes. Here we go again, the three days to be born story, mum's weapon of choice when she was truly furious with me. I was relieved that Pastor Green was on vacation as I knew he would have dressed as a clown too and there's no telling what mum's reaction would have been. She would likely have spontaneously combusted. Well, without this clown funeral, we won't be able to pay our bills. I wheeled the clown to the far end of the viewing room in between two beautiful bouquets of yellow roses, the deceased's favourite flower. I pushed open the lid and turned so I didn't have to look inside. 
Clowns were creepy enough, but a dead clown was even worse. I looked up to see that Mum had followed me. I won't have a part of this. Rock stars are one thing, but this is another. There will be mourners coming, dressed as clowns. It isn't right. I don't think anyone else will be dressing up as clowns, I said hopefully. I will not be a part of this mockery, Mum continued. I'm leaving. I shrugged. I knew it was pointless arguing with her. Janet tapped me on the shoulder. I could stay and help, she said, if you pay me for the hours. I almost agreed, but then a flash of Janet speaking to the mourners went through my mind, and it was as terrifying a thought as I had ever had. I smiled and shook my head. Thanks so much, but it will be fine. I appreciate the offer, though. I'm going to leave then. I'm tired of work, she said, confirming the wisdom of my decision. I had the food and drink all ready to go by the time Daisy arrived. To my relief, she wasn't wearing her clown makeup. How are you? I asked. Daisy forced a smile. I'm hanging in there. I showed her into the viewing room and left her at the casket. I'd only walked about two steps when Anna Stiles arrived, as impeccably groomed as always. Mourners walked in behind her. No one was in clown makeup. Anna walked over to peer in the casket. It's a little weird, isn't it? She said loudly, a dead clown. This time, she smelt like roses and jasmine. I sneezed. I took her by the elbow and maneuvered her outside the viewing room. To you and me, but to her daughter, it's exactly what she wanted. I hissed. At that moment, a clown walked through the front door. It gave me chills. I thought the dead clown would be the scariest thing I saw at the funeral. But I was wrong. The scariest thing I had ever seen was a clown that could move and talk and come near me. And even worse, he wasn't alone. Five clowns followed him. They all wore makeup and full costumes with colorful patches, zany hats, and wigs. It really was a bit much. And to me, it was scary. Still, there was nothing I could do about it. There was no stopping it. And as the funeral started in earnest, there didn't appear to be any problems. I kept an eye on Anna. She did not say anything else inappropriate, but mingled and spoke with a few people, offering her condolences. I wasn't sure if she told anyone who she was or why she was there, but if she did, no one seemed to mind her presence. And then disaster struck. Lynette's parents arrived. They were both in their 80s, and certainly closer to 90 than they were to 80. Daisy had spoken to me about them briefly during our first phone call, but she had said they didn't speak to her or her mother often. Lynette's father, Frank, had resented his daughter for becoming a clown and for having her own daughter follow in her footsteps. They were barely through the door when the old man, Frank, let his jaw drop open. You've got to be kidding me, Frank said in a loud voice. He turned to two of the clowns who were standing nearby, talking. Get out, he roared. This is my daughter. One of the clowns stepped forward. It was a woman with pink and purple hair and a big red rubber nose. Frank, we worked with your daughter. We loved Sunshine. Her name was Lynette, Frank yelled. Sunshine was a ridiculous face she never managed to outgrow. Leave, now. Daisy hurried in from the viewing area. They're welcome here, Grandpa, she said. They were Mum's friends. And you, I'm surprised you aren't in your little costume, he said. Through all of this, his wife had stayed quiet. Would you like some water? I asked him in an attempt to calm him. It didn't work. He waved his arms. I don't need water. I need these people to leave. I need them not to make a mockery of my daughter. Anna was writing in a notebook and smiling. That couldn't be good. Grandpa, I think you had better leave, Daisy said, placing her hand on his arm. Why should I leave? Frank roared. I don't think you should see Mum, Daisy said quietly. To my dismay, Frank managed to grasp her meaning right away. You didn't. Grandpa, please, Daisy said. Let me see her. 
he shook Daisy's hand from his arm and hurried into the viewing room. I couldn't bring myself to follow him. I remained in the foyer. I grimaced every time he yelled. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, Anna hurried over to me. This sure makes a good story, she said with malice. Chapter 9 After the clan funeral, Mum could barely bring herself to speak to me. I knew she just wanted to shout, I told you so, over and over, and for once I was impressed by her restraint. The cleaning lady Mum paid to come by once a week was coming today, and that meant Mum was feverishly cleaning everything. Not a single thing would need to be cleaned after my mother had finished with it, and of course Susan, the woman who came to clean, went to my mother's church. Mum was scrubbing the upstairs bathroom when Tara arrived unannounced. I made some sandwiches and prepared a salad and then ducked up to the bathroom to see if Mum wanted to join us for lunch. She did not. Tara and I had just started eating when Mum came in. Tara, Mum exclaimed, Laurel didn't tell me you were here. I had actually told her, but she must have been so busy polishing the bathroom floor that she hadn't really heard me. Oh, I hope that's okay, Tara said. Of course, but had I known, I would have cleaned the house. I shot her a look. Mum, you've been cleaning all day. You know what I mean, she snapped at me. Laurel, you drop some crumbs on the floor. Whatever will Susan think? Clean them up before she arrives. I can't be embarrassed by you any longer. I was bending over the floor looking for the crumbs that Mum thought were there when I heard her strident voice once more. Laurel, you should be using the good plates, she said loudly, and you should be sitting in the dining room. We're just having sandwiches, I protested. Nonsense. Tara, please let me set you up in the dining room. Tara knew my mother well enough to know it wasn't worth trying to argue, and so we spent ten minutes letting her move us into the dining room. Mum opened an old cedar cabinet and brought out her best antique fine bone china, musty smell and all. She made a big display of setting the table. This is mason china, she announced proudly. From the 18th century, Laurel and I eat from it all the time. No, we don't, I said without thinking, staring at the Chinese scenes. Mum turned her steely gaze on me. Laurel, I smelt an unholy scent emanating from your room earlier today. Were you indulging in new age practices again? If you mean my lemongrass candle, then yes, I said. Mum looked as if she were about to say something, but then her hand flew to her mouth. The soap, Mum exclaimed. She left the room in a hurry. The soap, Tara asked. The good hand soap for the bathroom, I said. I get the cheap stuff, but you get the good stuff. If only she knew you were a witch. Tara paled. Don't ever tell her. Of course not, I said. She'd call in a whole prayer team to conduct an exorcism. Tara laughed. Anyway, I came around because I have news. I mentioned Anna Stiles to Duncan last night. I was telling him that you were worried that she's going to write a bad story about the clown funeral. Duncan told me that the hit-and-run victim had been in contact with her for a lengthy period of time, according to the phone records. He thought it was pretty strange. I considered the news for a moment. She's a journalist, though, and he was an infamous crime boss, I said. Sure, he had served time and was allegedly on the straight and narrow, but he's the type of person a journalist would interview. But didn't you say the detectives don't tell Duncan anything? Tara shook her head. I said they don't tell him much, she corrected me. They ask Duncan questions, and that tips him off as to what leads their following. I smiled. I knew Anna Stiles was evil. I had a momentary fantasy about her being dragged away in handcuffs and then locked in prison without access to makeup or gym equipment. Have you thought of any other suspects? Tara asked. What about the mayor's wife? She was ripped off by the dead guy, according to Duncan. She showed up at his funeral. Isn't that weird? She went to the funeral? I asked. Why? That's what I just said, Tara laughed. It's weird. We sat in silence for a moment, our lunch forgotten. 
So what now? Tara asked. I'm not sure, I admitted. More digging, I guess. It seems like I should look into the whole situation with the mayor's wife. Tara nodded. She had the motive as her family heirloom was stolen by the dead guy. Duncan said she never did get it back. She stood up. I have to go. Thanks for lunch. I'll help you clear the table. I waved her off. No, that's fine. I showed Tara to the door and then cleared the table, gingerly taking mum's 300-year-old china into the kitchen and placing it carefully on the countertop. Ernie was in the kitchen, staring longingly at the refrigerator. It's weird, he lamented. I can't eat and I don't need to, but man, do I want to. I miss it. Before I could reply, Preston slowly materialised. How are you doing? I asked him. Ernie snorted rudely. How do you think he's doing? He's as good as anyone would be if they were buried in their work. He cackled. I shot him a glare and he vanished. Preston, are you sure it was a man? I asked the apparition. I think so, but I can't be sure, he said. The hands were strong. I nodded. Anna was pretty strong. She obviously worked out and worked out hard. Do you think two people could have been involved? He shook his head, which was white and transparent, barely formed. It didn't feel like it, if that makes sense. I never saw them, but you can feel people. I only felt one. I nodded. One person, strong hands, and probably yet not necessarily a man. I wish I could be more help, Preston said as he started to fade. A part of me feels like I'm missing something. Well, perhaps you are, and perhaps it will come to you, I said. In the meantime, I have a few people I want to look into. People you think could have killed me? I would bet one of them did, I said confidently. Who? I'm going to start with the mayor's wife, I said to thin air, as Preston had already vanished. The sound of gospel music blaring through the house alerted me to the fact that Susan was cleaning. She liked to preach at me while she was cleaning, so I hurried out the front door and went in search of mum. I found her in my office, sitting in my chair behind the desk, staring at my laptop. We need money, she said. I bit my tongue. I wanted to say something sarcastic, but I resisted the urge. I needed to humour her so she would do what I wanted, so I simply nodded. I've been thinking of ways to get the business going again, I said. Mum shut my laptop and looked at me. What did you come up with? I think we should invite the mayor's wife over for dinner. The mayor's wife? Helen? I nodded. Why? The truth was I needed to ask the mayor's wife about her stolen jewels and the man who had stolen them. However, I needed something to pitch to my mother, so I launched into my prepared speech. Helen has good standing with people in this town. If she says there's nothing to worry about, people will believe it, so we should have her over for dinner. Helen goes to my church, my mother said. I know, Mum, but it would help to have her over for dinner. Mum seemed to be considering what I was saying. Okay, when? Tomorrow, I said hopefully, whenever suits her. Mum nodded. All right, I'll call her. Chapter 10 I'll get it. I hurried to the front door. I opened it up, expecting to see the mayor's wife, Helen, but instead I found myself face to face with Ian. Ian, no, I said. He looked bewildered. No? I gathered my wits. Sorry, I meant to say that we're having someone over. Ian shot me a pitying look. Of course I know that, dear. Your mum invited Helen, the mayor's wife. Mum told you? Mum invited you over? I was so shocked that I didn't reprimand him for calling me dear. Ian nodded and stepped inside. I would think you would know by now that your mother and I have no secrets. And that's really weird and creepy, so you need to stop being friends, I thought. Aloud, I said, Mum's in the kitchen. Ian sprinted for the kitchen as if the devil himself were behind him. Perhaps he thought he was. By the time I reached the kitchen, 
He had taken my place at the large salad bowl and was tossing the salad in a vinaigrette dressing. What can I do to help? I asked. Nothing, Mum said as she put a dish into the oven. You go and wait for Helen to arrive. At precisely 6.30, the doorbell rang again, and once more I crossed to open the door. Hi, come on in, I said. Helen smiled warmly at me. I have to say it's always my husband being invited places, and I'm just his plus one. It was nice of you to think of me. Ian and my mother rushed into the room and gushed all over Helen. What would you like to drink? Mum asked her. Red wine, please. Mum gasped. Helen, I must inform you that I do not believe in wine. I signed the temperance pledge when I was seven, and I have never let a drop of the demon alcohol pass my lips. Helen appeared to be at a loss. Would you like something else to drink? I asked her, tempted to offer her my stash of wine that Ian and Mum hadn't so far found when rummaging through my room. What is there? She asked meekly. I have delicious imitation non-alcohol white wine, Mum said smugly. I bought it earlier today, just for you, Helen. Thank you. I would like a glass of that, please, Helen said. Come into the dining room, Mum said. Dinner is about to be served. Helen took her seat while Mum remained standing. She poured the fake wine into three glasses and handed a glass to Helen. Helen took a sip, coughed, and then set her glass aside. I wondered where Ian was and why Mum hadn't poured him a glass of fake wine. I shrugged and sat next to Helen while my mother sat at the head of the table. Laurel, why not sit across from our guest? Mum asked me, her lips pursed. I thought Ian would be sitting there, I said, and I don't want to sit next to him, I added silently. Oh, Ian isn't going to be sitting. Why would you think such a thing? My mother asked me. Ian serves us. I looked at her with my mouth open. You're having Ian serve us? I asked. She narrowed her eyes at me. Have you taken leave of your senses, Laurel? It's what he does, isn't it? She looked nervously at Helen. I was thoroughly confused by that point. I started to catch on when Ian appeared with a tray loaded with three salad bowls. He was wearing a black frilly apron and maid's cap. Ian set a bowl in front of each of us. Thank you, Mum said to him in an imperious tone. And then it dawned on me. Helen was someone of importance, and my mother loved to make herself seem important as well. Apparently, Mum needed to pretend that we had a butler, or a servant, to impress the mayor's wife. I dragged my eyes away from Ian with some difficulty, and turned my attention to the matter at hand. Helen, I actually saw you not too long ago. The funeral, Helen said, nodding. The clown funeral, my mother asked, horror-stricken. Helen looked thoroughly confused. The clown funeral? No, it was the one before that, I told Mum, that man who was hit by a car. Mum turned to Helen. You knew him? The deceased man was a criminal, I said to no one in particular. He was a famous jewel thief. He'd been released from prison only recently. Helen nodded. Yes, yeah, some years ago, before he was arrested, he broke into our home and stole jewellery from me. My mother gasped and held her hand over her heart. That's terrible, she said. I will think and pray for you. Helen shrugged. Thank you, Thelma. But it was some time ago, after all. He never did say where the jewellery was. I doubt it will ever be recovered. Of course, he was involved in organised crime, so who knows what happened to it. That's terrible, Mum said again, shaking her head. Thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God. I shall take comfort from the fact that he will suffer eternal torture while burning in hell. I ignored her and spoke to Helen. So he wasn't a friend of yours? I asked, knowing full well that he wasn't. I mean, with you going to the funeral and all. Helen flushed, beat red. My husband was very angry. Her voice trailed away, and she cast her eyes downwards at the table. Your husband was angry? I prompted. Oh yes, 
Gregory was furious. The jewelry was actually his mother's. She left it to me when she died. Don't quote me on this, but his mother was miserable and mean to me when she was alive, so it wasn't anything I treasured. Gregory worshipped his mother, though, and I've never seen him so mad. He's still hounding the police to track down the jewellery. I nodded. I still had no idea why Helen had attended the funeral. Thankfully, she continued. Gregory was going to attend the funeral to see if he could get any clues as to Alec Mason's associates. He figured the murderer would be there, and he figured that the murderer would inherit the organised crime business. He thought that the man would know where his mother's jewellery was. I was shocked. So he sent you in to spy for him? Helen shook her head. No, nothing like that. Gregory was called away on urgent business at the last minute, so I decided to go to help him. He wasn't happy when he found out. He said it was dangerous, and he was right, considering what happened to the funeral singer. I nodded. I had been so engrossed in conversation that I hadn't noticed Ian appearing with dessert. You are better off without jewellery, he said to Helen. God probably wanted the jewellery to be stolen. I couldn't help myself. I just had to ask. How do you figure that, Ian? He looked pleased to be asked. Because the Apostle Paul threw everything into the sea when he was about to be shipwrecked. He threw the cargo and the ship's tackle overboard. Don't you see? No, I said truthfully. Ian shook his head. Paul could not be saved unless he got rid of all his possessions. So that proves that God doesn't want us to have possessions. I frowned. Ian, you're driving a car. Does that mean you should walk everywhere? Stop annoying the help, Laurel, Mum said. And don't be so smart. You know a car is not part of a ship's tackle. Ian disappeared back into the kitchen with a flourish of his black, frilly apron. I put my head in my hands and sighed. Chapter 11 I checked the time on my iPhone as I made my way down the sidewalk. I was a few minutes early for coffee with Tara, but that was just enough time to get a table. I was particularly looking forward to it because our recent girls' night out had been partly ruined by Basil and his hot date, not to mention my encounter with Basil afterwards and what a disaster that had been. I tried to force it from my mind. I had already let Basil ruin one outing. I thought I'd had chemistry with him, but that was apparently nothing compared to whatever he had with the journalist. I was mortified that I'd kissed him back, only to be dismissed in such a way. Despite my best efforts, the only thing I managed to think about on my walk was Basil. I wasn't in a good mood. For one, it was a particularly glary day. I took off my sunglasses and wiped them on a tissue. I held them up to the sun and could see that they still needed a good clean. I walked a few more steps without them, but was forced to squint at the glare reflected off every available surface, windows, chrome, and passing cars. I put them back on, smudges and all. My nerves were on edge, and the grating sound of a truck using its compression brakes went right through my head as did the loud abuse hurled at the truck driver by the pedestrian who was halfway across the road at the time. I cheered up when I caught the scent of good coffee carried down the street on a good breeze, the same breeze that, moments later, caught my skirt, along with a dozen or so discarded chocolate wrappers. I was so intent upon holding down my skirt that at first I did not identify the man walking towards me, when recognition dawned, I broke out in a cold sweat. What to do? Should I cross the street? Slap myself on the forehead as if I'd forgotten something and then hurry back the way I'd come? I shook my head. Basil was the one in the wrong. He should be the one to duck into a shop. Still, if I hesitated any longer, we might actually have to talk to one another. Just the thought of it made me sick to my stomach. Laurel? Basil waved to me and then hurried down the sidewalk. I'm glad I ran into you. The nerve of the man, I thought. He's acting as if nothing happened the other night. I greeted him with a curt nod and tried to act normal. If he was going to act as if nothing happened, 
then so was I. I was not going to give him the satisfaction of seeing how much it bothered me. Did you see Anna's article this morning? Of course it would be about Anna, I thought with irritation. I gave him a tight smile. Yes, it was favorable, thank goodness. Basil appeared to be surprised at my indifference. I think it turned out wonderfully. She highlighted the celebrity funerals in a positive manner. In fact, she didn't mention the murders at all. I resisted the urge to say something catty. I'll call her and thank her. Basil was still talking. She's a sharp journalist, but even she can be reasoned with. Although I must say it wasn't easy talking her out of using the murders in her article. I narrowed my eyes and glared at him. Did he want me to thank him? He seemed a little too proud of that statement. And exactly how had he talked her out of using the murders in her article? An awful image popped into my head of Basil and Anna sharing a hug. Of Basil holding her the way he had held me that night. Laurel? His voice jolted me back into the moment. I realized I had zoned out. Thanks. I appreciate you talking to her, I said after an interval. You're welcome. He smiled the way he used to smile at me. He was a confusing, contradictory man. Was he an evil twin, or did he have multiple personality disorder? It was all too much. The silence hung between us. The moment couldn't have been more awkward. Basil was the one to break the silence. Laurel, I wanted to talk about the other night. I shook my head. I'm about to meet someone for coffee. I can't be late. Meet someone? He asked with a measure of surprise. An odd look crossed his face. If I were feeling hopeful, I would have sworn that it looked like jealousy. Whatever he was feeling quickly vanished. Of course, I apologize for holding you up. Perhaps we could talk later? I brushed by him and hurried away. It wasn't the most mature way to break off a conversation, but I'd had about as much as I could take. Tara was already there. I've already ordered you a latte and a macaroon, she said, sporting a whipped froth moustache from her energetic gulping. What's wrong? I thought you'd be a lot happier today. I saw the newspaper article on your business. Things seem to be looking up. I sat down and wrapped my hands around my latte. I am happy about it. It's great news. By the way, you have a froth moustache. Tara dabbed at her mouth with a napkin. Seriously, you're pale. Is anything wrong? I shook my head. Tara's expression was skeptical. Now, Spill, you've been off ever since we saw Basil and that newspaper chick together. What's up? I took a sip of my latte and then set down the glass. Okay, well, you know how I walked home that night? Tara nodded. Basil drove past and said he'd give me a ride home. He walked me to the door, and then he kissed me. He what? Tara shrieked. Why didn't you tell me? Shush. I looked around the coffee shop, but no one was staring. I was too upset. He kissed me and then said we could never be together. Tara leant across the table. You're kidding, right? I shook my head. Are we talking a peck on the cheek or a real kiss? A real kiss, I said. And then he said, we can't be together, I'm sorry. And then what happened? Why didn't you tell me? I hurried inside and shut the door. And the answer to your second question is that I was too upset. I could hardly bring myself to think about it, much less speak about it. I took a bite of the macaroon, but all I could taste was cardboard. I knew it should be tasty. I could smell the flavor locked in the moist center. I could feel the slight crisp of the outer shell give way to a warm frosting center, yet it might as well have been glue. And I saw him just now. He said he wanted to talk about it. Basil actually wanted to talk about it, Tara asked incredulously. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's over with. I dabbed at my eyes with a crumpled tissue. I'm just mad that I let it get to me at all. Tara waved her hands in the air. Why wouldn't it get to you? It's not like you waved a neon sign in his face and said, kiss me, dum-dum. I had to laugh. Seriously, though, that's so weird. Why would he kiss you if he didn't want to? I shrugged and replayed the scene a thousand times in my head and then a thousand more for good measure. 
No matter how I looked at it, I was still no closer to an answer. Nothing about it made sense. He probably had someone else on his mind. Tara tapped a finger against her cheek. No, he's not going to kiss you just because you didn't kiss her. That makes no sense. He did have a bad breakup some time back. Men never seem to get over bad breakups as well as women do. Perhaps he's still upset over that. It might not be anything to do with Anna Styles. I abandoned my attempt to eat the macaroon and put what was left of it on my plate. I don't know, Tara. I'd rather not think of what they did and did not do. It's not my business either way. I'm just saying that maybe there is more to everything than meets the eye. He might have a really good reason for how he's acting, Tara mused. Maybe, but unless he has an evil twin that escaped from the attic that night, I can't see anything he could come up with that would make it okay. Tara laughed. I think an evil twin would make it worse. It's bad enough trying to figure out just one of him. I'll drink to that. I lifted my coffee in a toast and then took a hearty gulp. To change the subject, has Duncan said anything else about the case? Tara shook her head. And you said that you don't suspect the mayor's wife anymore? I'm starting to think perhaps it was the mayor, I said in a low voice. Helen said he was the one who was upset about the jewellery theft. She said the jewellery had belonged to his mother. From what Helen said, she didn't get along with her mother-in-law. So, bottom line, Helen didn't care one bit about the jewellery, and it was her husband who was so upset. That's what she told you, Tara said. But if she is the murderer, then that's exactly what she would say. If there's one thing I've learnt from being a cop's wife, it's that you can't always take people at face value. Trust no one. Chapter 12 I had sent Anna Stiles a polite email thanking her for the article she had written about the funeral home. I hadn't expected a reply, so when her email arrived, I leant forward in my office chair and peered at the screen. I need to speak with you. I will be over soon. Short, sharp, and to the point, just like the woman herself, apart from the fact that she was tall. What could she possibly want from me? and the nerve of her assuming that I would be at the funeral home all day and she could stop by whenever she liked. Despite myself, I was intrigued. What could it be? We had no more reason to contact each other. She had done her story, and that was that. I did not like the woman. However, I was grateful to her because she had written a positive story about the funeral home when she most certainly could have torn me to shreds in the same way that the other paper had. How much Basil had to do with that, I most certainly did not want to know. The doorbell rang, so I hurried out the front, expecting Anna. Instead, it was Duncan's partner, Brian. Hey, Laurel. He handed me a black tape. We'd finish with this. The tape was my surveillance footage. There were a few small and discreet cameras throughout the funeral home, installed by my father at least a decade before. They recorded onto a series of black tapes that would erase themselves every 48 hours. Dad had installed the security system after a woman had stolen an expensive watch from her dead sister during a wake. It had caused quite a scene when the dead woman's husband realised the watch had gone missing. I took the tape from Brian. Did it help? I asked. He shook his head. Not really. The detective in charge of the case said he went over it three times and there's nothing. They thought it would be a good lead, but sometimes things don't work out. Still, it was good that we had the chance. When he left, I walked back into our tiny security room and sat on an uncomfortable metal folding chair in front of a VCR and a small monitor. I placed the tape into the VCR. I skipped around, speeding forward and going back, but I couldn't see anything that stood out. I set the tape back into the machine so it would be erased and recorded on again. I was halfway back to my office when Anna arrived. I should have smelt her coming. Like before, she was wearing strong perfume, this one a heady floral fragrance. It was a pleasant enough perfume, but once again, there was just too much of it. 
It was as if she had bathed in it. I admit that I was annoyed to see how nice she looked, although she always looked nice. Expensive clothing, her hair done perfectly, her makeup the same, and, as always, a mixture of small good jewellery and large fake jewellery. It was strange to see such a muscle-bound woman look as feminine as she did. Everything about Anna annoyed me, and I wanted to get our meeting over quickly. I have some questions, she barked at me. She pushed past me and headed for my office. By the time I got to my office, she was already sitting in the chair opposite my desk. I hurried around the desk to take my seat. Preston Kerr, she said. You want to ask me questions about Preston Kerr? I should have known. Yes. As soon as she took her seat opposite me, she leant forward. I'm making good progress with the story. Good for you, I said, completely disinterested in her and her little story. She was so sure it was going to open any door she wanted for her, and she was probably right. Anyway, thanks for that article. That was good of you. Anna waved her hand at me, as if she were shooing away a fly. Don't thank me. Thank your accountant, Basil. He's the one who talked me into it. I bit my lip. Anna smiled at me. He's really quite funny too, isn't he? Still, he's your accountant, so I'm sure you know all about him. Yes, I said through gritted teeth. What did you want to ask me about? Right. Anna leant forward. For a moment, I thought she was going to take out her tape recorder and set it on the desk like she had done the first time I had spoken with her, but she did not. This isn't off the record or anything, but I just don't want a digital copy of anything we're about to say, she whispered. I have a very good memory. It's a gift. I nodded, once again intrigued, my annoyance with Anna and her meeting with Basil forgotten at least for the moment. There was no need for her to whisper. After all, we were alone in the building. My mother was at church, praying for God to help her take responsibility for her own actions, even though they weren't her fault. Anna looked down her nose at me as if I were a cockroach or something equally distasteful. Anyway, back to Preston Kerr. What do you know about him? I don't really know too much, I said. He was a funeral singer I hired online. I had been told he had arrived, but I couldn't find him, so I went looking for him. When I was upstairs looking for him, I heard someone scream, so I went downstairs. Someone else had found him in the bathroom, dead. He was strangled. She said it as a statement rather than a question, but I answered. It looked that way to me, but you'd have to ask the police. Anna narrowed her eyes slightly. Okay, now to the funeral. It was for a man who had been hit by a stolen car? Yes, I said, a hit and run. Someone might have been trying to kill him. I wondered why she asked. It had been all over the news. Anna smiled. Her smiles were always small and full of malice, or at least they appeared that way to me. Trying? They did kill him. I was irritated. I meant that I'm not sure if he was killed on purpose. The police seemed to think he was, Anna said. I'm not a cop, I said with a shrug. Who was at the funeral? I stared at the woman. Who was there? Lots of people were there. You were there too. I was only there in my capacity as a reporter, Anna said. So I didn't know the mourners. Was anyone of importance there? Who are you hoping was there? I asked. You seem like you want me to say someone in particular. She shook her head. Not at all, I'm just curious. Well, like I said, there were lots of people there. I didn't know them either, apart from the deceased's brother who organized the funeral. Anna nodded. I hear he'd had some trouble with the law. I knew that to be true as well, but did not want to admit that to her. He seemed nice enough to me. Who else was there? Friends? I nodded. Of course. We don't have a guest list, though. We never do. I thought I had better say that before she asked for one. Anyone else? Any people hurt by the deceased? Hurt? 
Anna narrowed her eyes once more. He had only recently been released from prison. Whoever murdered him obviously had a problem with him, and whoever murdered him was probably at the funeral. Did you see anyone acting suspiciously at all? I don't know any of the people who came, I said. I did know Helen, the mayor's wife, but I wasn't going to tell Anna. Helen had been robbed by the dead man and had gone to his funeral. Yet, if Helen could be believed, her husband was the one who was angry about the stolen jewellery. That didn't seem to be the answer Anna was looking for. So you didn't see anything strange? I shook my head. Her questions were making me wonder if she knew more than she was letting on. And from there, it wasn't a stretch to wonder if she was involved in some way. She was searching for something, trying to hit upon an answer she wanted. What sort of answer? It occurred to me that she sounded as if she was trying to find a likely suspect. But why? Because she was trying to solve a case so she could write about it? Or because she was guilty of killing both men and so needed to write a story pinning it on someone else? That was a bit of a stretch, of course, but I disliked Anna and so was willing to go with it. Nothing at all, she persisted. Someone was murdered in your funeral home and you didn't notice anything odd. I'm sorry, I can't think of anything unusual at all. Anna stood. I can see myself out. I watched her go, wondering when she would be back. I could tell she wasn't finished with me. Chapter 13 Somehow my mother had managed to talk me into attending Ian's birthday party. She was having it at her house, and as I lived there too, I was hard put to come up with a good excuse to avoid it. For that reason, my mother didn't have to ask me any more than, well, about 50 times. Finally, I agreed. I was getting ready for the event when I heard mum calling me. Laurel, did you have a meeting at the funeral home? I went out of my room and stood at the top of the stairs looking down at her. No, why? There's someone there, she said. I went back into my room and looked out of my window. Sure enough, a long black sedan was parked outside the funeral home. I couldn't see anyone behind the wheel, so I assumed they were up on the front porch ringing the doorbell. Who is it? My mother asked from downstairs. I don't know, I said. I'll go find out. I pulled on some socks and shoes and hurried to the funeral home. A large man in a black suit stood on the porch. He turned to face me. Oh, I should have figured you didn't have to work on weekends, he said with a slimy smile. He offered me his hand and I shook it slowly and briefly. Can I help you? I asked. Surely you know who I am. His round, bald head tilted to one side. I shook my head. No, I'm sorry. Have we met? Your father didn't speak of me. I don't know what your name is, I said politely. My name is David Dunn. When I didn't say anything, he sighed. I own Dunn Funeral Home in Tamworth. Dunn Funeral Home was a bigger, glitzier, and in my opinion, tackier funeral home that did triple the business of my place. Oh yes, I said icily. What can I do for you, Mr. Dunn? Please, colleagues should call me David, he said, especially colleagues I am suing. Suing? I thought I would come up and speak with you before our lawyers got involved. You do have a lawyer, yes? But the short version is I came up with the so-called celebrity funerals first, and as such you stole my idea and you're profiting from it. I plan on getting my cut of that profit and I'm sure you'll agree I'm entitled to it. I was furious. You're not entitled to anything. You can't own an idea. Ah, the man said, holding his finger up. So you do admit I had the idea first. What? No, I said. I'm just saying that you can't own an idea, even if you had it first, which you didn't. I came up with the idea. Anyway, ideas are not subject to copyright. David Dunn laughed and shook his head. Your celebrity funerals are disasters. 
If you think they're disasters, then why do you want a piece of them? It's owed to me. I don't owe you anything. The man stepped forward. Let me tell you something, Missy. Your father and I didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things, but we respected one another. You're just a little girl bumbling her way through a business idea of mine, and I'm not going to allow that. Get off my property now, I said angrily. I know your type. My type, I said icily. Your type? You're making such a mess of things you can't keep the business going, so you're grasping at straws. I did the service for the funeral singer who was murdered here. They came to me, because everyone knows what a mess your place is. That stung. You're a bully, and you need to leave, I said. Now. The man stared at me for a while, and then he smiled thinly. You can expect a call from my lawyers. He left the porch and got into his car. I stood on the top step and watched him drive down the road. I went back home, fury causing my body to shake. Mum was standing at the door waiting for me to return. What was it? Nothing, I lied. I went inside and shut the door, but had not gone more than three steps when there was a knock on the door. I hoped it wasn't David Dunn. I opened the door to see John Jones. This was infinitely worse than David Dunn. John was sexist, rude, and boring. When I had first moved back home, my mother had tried to set me up with John Jones. There were no prizes for guessing that John went to her church. Are you ready, Laurel? John asked. I was puzzled. Ready for what? Ian's party, Mum said from behind me. You needed a date, and I invited John to be your date. And so I found myself in one of those moods where I was pretty sure I was just going to burn down the house and the funeral home and become a drifter, hitchhiking and jumping trains as I went from town to town, just so I didn't have to be around my mother anymore. I closed my eyes and counted to about one million in the hope that the feeling would pass. Hi, John, I said when I opened my eyes. I knew it wouldn't do any good to argue, so I was just going to have to suffer through John Jones, my mother, and Ian, the birthday boy. Twenty or so other people arrived just after John, as did Ian, with a woman I assumed was his girlfriend, the adventurous one. She did not go to Mum's church. Thank you so much for coming, Ian said to all and sundry. This is my girlfriend, Audrey. Nice to meet you all, Audrey said. I smiled. I feel like I've already met you. I said before I could stop myself, thinking back to the times I had heard Ian discussing his girlfriend with my clueless mother. The woman looked at me strangely, so I modified my original statement. I mean, Ian has told me so much about you that I feel like I've already met you. Audrey appeared to be normal, which wasn't something I could say for Ian, my mother, or John. Oh, Audrey said, that's nice. Ian interrupted her and introduced Janet. Oh, so you're the one who's living in sin with Ian, Janet said. You're much better looking than Ian and not as weird. I would have thought you could do much better. She smiled and walked away. Audrey froze, a shocked expression on her face. I figured she was trying to decide whether or not Janet's words were a compliment. Don't mind Janet, I said quietly. She's nice. She doesn't mean things to come out like that. Audrey still appeared to be shaken. Oh, can I get you something to drink? She asked me. I'll do that, John said, stepping forward. This is a date, so that's my job. He looked at me. Punch? Yes, I'd like to, I said sweetly. Right in the head and hard enough to knock you out. Mum glared at me and reached over, pinching my arm. Rude? she whispered. Yes, punch, please, I said to a confused John. He nodded and walked over to the big bowl on a long table against the wall. John stayed glued to me like he was afraid I would vanish into thin air if he took his eyes off me, and to be honest, there was a good chance that I would. At the very least, every ten minutes or so, one of the people I spoke to said something to make me reconsider the whole train-hopping drifter thing. I huddled into a corner and tried to make myself invisible. 
I thought about my earlier meeting with David Dunn. I wondered if he'd had something to do with Preston Kerr's death. The murder had certainly been driving business his way, and he sure seemed like the kind of man who would do anything to come out on top. I had to add him to my list of suspects, the one I went over and over in my head. Still, I was worried he was on my list because I didn't like him. Anna was on my list for the same reason. But no, he really did have something to gain, and at the very least I needed to look at him and see if he fitted with any of the other clues. I wasn't anywhere close to solving Preston's murder. Laurel? I heard Mum's voice screech. Laurel? Laurel? I reluctantly left my corner and went over to Mum. Your date has been looking for you, Laurel, she said loudly. I can't believe you abandoned your date. What did I ever do to deserve a daughter like you? I hope one day you have a daughter as horrible as yourself. Then you will realise just how I've suffered. I put my hands on my hips. Mum, John Jones is not my date. He never was my date, and he will never be my date. The sound of collective gasps drew my attention. I looked around at Mum's friends, all of whom were clearly horrified. They at once averted their eyes and whispered to each other. I could make out the words of those closest to me. They were saying I was an ungrateful daughter and a rude woman, and they wondered how Mum managed to put up with me. In general, they were all sorry for Mum. I was furious. She always managed to make me look like the bad one. I was about to storm off to my room, but Ian was blocking my way. He was standing at the bottom of the stairs, surrounded by gifts. It's time for me to open my presents, he announced. I sighed. It looked as if I would have to stay a bit longer. Perhaps I could go to the funeral home and lie inside a casket. At least no one would find me there. Ian gleefully reached for a gift. Oh, the first one's from Thelma and Laurel, he said, tearing the wrapping paper into shreds. I thought it was nice that my mother had put my name on the card along with hers. That sentiment did not last long. Ian held up a book to murmurs of appreciation. The title was Deliverance from the Demon Alcohol, a how-to exorcism book for beginners. Everyone turned to look at me. I thought that would be useful, Ian, Mother said, nodding to me. I rarely drink, I protested. Those possessed by the demon alcohol are always in denial, a woman standing next to Mum said, and her words drew a chorus of Amen. Chapter 14 I knew I needed some answers, and I knew just the place to get them. I made the call. Hey, what heaven, how may I help you? The voice was breathless. Katie? This is Laurel Bay, Thelma's daughter. Oh, sure, Laurel. How are you? Sorry about the wait. I've got Agnes under some curlers and I didn't want her hair to burn. You know, you burn off someone's hair just once and it gets all over town. I laughed because I figured she was joking, but then I wasn't so sure. At any rate, Katie was the gossip queen in town and if I had questions, I was willing to bet that she had the answers. Do you have time to fit me in today? Have you changed your mind? Do you want your hair purple or pink after all? Her voice was hopeful. I grimaced. Actually, I was just after a manicure. There was a long silence and I was about to ask if she was still there, but then she spoke. How's three for you? Perfect, I said. When I stepped into Katie's salon, there was no sign of her. I peered into the salon itself only to see a figure at the back of the room that I didn't and couldn't recognise. Its face was wrapped in bandages, and green goo was finding its way out of the cracks. My jaw dropped. It looked just like an Egyptian mummy. And what was that overpowering smell? It reminded me of stale fertiliser and seaweed. Katie appeared. Laurel, hi. Come this way. I was unable to speak, so I motioned to the mummy. I reached into my purse and found a tissue, which I held firmly over my nose. It's a facial wrap. You should try it. Have you heard of mud masks? I gingerly moved the tissue from my nose and mouth so I could speak. Is that a mud mask? 
Katie shook her head. No, it's a horse manure and spirulina face wrap, so it's the same type of thing as a mud mask. It's a new service for the salon. It's great for serious wrinkles around the eyes. We just wrap them away. She held the door open for me and I hurried in, keen to escape the smell. Mercifully, Katie shut the door behind me. Have a seat. I sat down. Is that lavender in that oil burner? Katie nodded. Could you bring it closer to me, please? Sure, she said. I have a cold, so I can't smell anything at the moment. That explains it, I thought. Soon, there was no horse manure to be smelt, only the fragrance of lavender essential oil. I sighed and relaxed into the manicure. So how are things going? Katie asked me as she massaged sweet orange oil lotion into my hands. I saw that terrible article in the Sydney paper. Just a horrid thing that man wrote about you. I nodded. The local article was a lot better. I saw that one too, Katie said. Actually, I was wondering if you knew David Dunn. Katie reached for her file. Yes, he has a funeral home in Tamworth. He did the funeral for that man who was killed at your place, the funeral singer. What was his name? Preston Kerr. Right, I knew it was Preston something, Katie said. At any rate, I heard there was a bit of a scene at his funeral. I pricked up my ears. What do you mean? Katie signaled for me to give her my left hand. Apparently, someone confronted the dead guy's wife at his funeral. I was about to question her further when the song track changed. Sure, I knew that Katie went to Mum's church, but the music so far had been unobtrusive background music. Now the music was different. I winced as I heard the blaring words, The world is very evil. The times are waxing late. Be sober and keep vigil. The judge is at the gate. Katie, would you mind very much changing the music if it isn't a bother? Katie looked taken aback. You don't like it? I shook my head. Sorry, but it's your mother's favourite hymn, Katie said. Exactly, I thought. Aloud, I said. Mum's version is at least quieter. Katie popped out of the room. Mercifully, the volume dropped moments later. It's such a quiet hymn that I always play it at full volume, she explained when she came back and took up her file once more. Everyone needs to realise that the world is evil, so that's why I play it loudly. I grimaced. Speaking of the world being evil, I said, silently congratulating myself on the segue, what was the confrontation at Preston Kerr's funeral about? Katie's face lit up. His wife was having an affair. Her tone was nonchalant, but not believably so. I could tell she was chomping at the bit to tell me the news. With whom? I asked. Preston Kerr's brother. I gasped, and if both my hands were not covered in exfoliating cream, I would have slapped one over my mouth. Did Preston know? I figured he didn't, because he had never mentioned it to me. I have no idea, Katie said. Who brought it up at the funeral? I asked. It was her own sister. Can you believe that? I shook my head. Wow. Poor Preston Kerr. Not only had he been murdered because he had overheard something he shouldn't have, but his wife had been cheating on him with his own brother. And then something dawned on me. What if his murder hadn't been caused by what he'd overheard? What if his wife had wanted to be free to carry on with the brother? Of course, divorce would be the easier option, but some people just weren't wired correctly. My mother was a good indication of that. Did his wife admit to it? I asked. Katie giggled. Oh no, of course not. She told her sister she was crazy. But do you think she was having an affair? I don't know, Katie said with a smile. I just report the gossip. I'm not sure what's true and what isn't. Anyway, it's bad that it's affecting your business. I jumped, and that earned me a sharp jab to my cuticle. What do you mean? Lots of my clients have said that they're going to avoid your funeral home from now on. They think it's pretty strange that there have been two murders and so close together at that. But Tiffany's murder was solved, 
I protested. Katie shrugged and slapped hot towels on my hands. Ernie materialized behind Katie, and I jumped. Oh, sorry, did that hurt? Are the towels too hot? I hurried to reassure her. No, that's fine. I glared at Ernie. She's right, you know, he said. If the murder isn't solved soon, you'll lose all your clients to Tamworth. It's a dying business. I narrowed my eyes at him. As Katie buffed my nails with vigour, I formulated a plan. The police had not yet arrested anyone for Preston's murder. I had every confidence that they would solve the case, but I was fairly certain that I would be broke by the time they did. With people abandoning the funeral home, there was only one thing I could do. Chapter 15 The first part of my plan involved visiting a florist in the next town. The man who served me had big ears and a bald head that shone under the flickering lights of the ceiling. He gave me the third degree about what I wanted the flowers for, followed by lengthy advice. I bought a nice bouquet of Asiatic lilies, snowdrops and gerbera daisies, all in soft pastel pinks. The man wrapped the bunch in pale green tissue paper, and I made my escape. As my Google search had revealed, Donna Kerr lived just north of that town, right on the outskirts. I pulled up in front of a brick, two-story house, surrounded by expansive gardens. I parked next to one of the two cars in the drive and made my way to the house, the flowers held in the crook of my arm. I knocked on the door, but no one answered. I tried a few more times, still nothing. As there were two cars parked in front of the house and all the upstairs windows were open, I figured that someone was home. I walked around the side of the home, waving the flowers above my head to ward off the magpie that had just dive-bombed me. It took off with a loud caw. My eyes fell on a large fountain in the centre of the garden. The headpiece was a large cherub with a jet of water spraying from the top of its small harp. I was so focused on the fountain and the sweetly pungent scent of honeysuckle that I didn't notice anyone present. Can I help you? A voice said from the side. I whirled around to see a short, red-faced woman. She was buttoning up her blue shirt. A man stood next to her, tightening his belt. Mrs. Kerr? I asked. Yes, I'm Donna Kerr, the woman said. Can I help you? I'm Laurel Bay, I replied. Your husband, Preston, was at my funeral parlour the day he was... My voice trailed away. Murdered, the man said. Preston was my brother. Cameron was trying to console me, Donna said quickly. I've been in a terrible state since Preston was killed at your establishment. It sounded as if she was trying to push the blame on me. I was sure she was simply trying to distract me with the murder, so I would not focus on the fact that I had walked in on something taking place between her and her dead husband's brother. Their clothes were wrinkled and dirty, and there was a clump of grass stuck to the side of her head. I held out the flowers. Yes, that's why I stopped by, I said. I wanted to bring you these. I know you had his funeral somewhere else, but I wanted to bring you these and tell you I was sorry for your loss. Donna stepped over and took the flowers. They're lovely. Thank you very much. She sniffed them. Well, I was just leaving, Cameron said, after having finally tightened his belt properly. He did not notice that a tall rose stem was sticking out of his hair, pointing towards the sky. Right, thanks for stopping by. Donna stepped forward as if she was going to kiss him, but caught herself in time and awkwardly patted him on the arm instead. She watched him go and then turned to me. I was just about to put on some coffee. I wondered why she said that. I knew what she had just been about to do, and it had nothing to do with coffee. Would you like to come in for a cup? She continued. I couldn't believe my luck. Yes, that sounds lovely, I said, and I followed her out of the garden. The door opened up directly into a large kitchen. Donna set the flowers in a vase on the centre of the kitchen island. I sat on a stool on one side of the island while she busied herself with the coffee. I didn't know Preston had a brother, I said. 
I realized that my comment made it sound as if I knew the man. I did, of course, but only by speaking to his ghost, so I added, I mean, we only spoke briefly. Mm, Preston and Cameron were close when they were younger, but they had a falling out when their parents divorced. Each one sided with a different parent, and they could go months without speaking. It was sad to hear stories about them as children and then see them so far apart. Cameron was upset about it, as was Preston, she added. I nodded. I certainly don't blame you for Preston's death, she continued. I saw that article in the Sydney paper, and I felt rather bad about it. I've been meaning to call you and tell you, but I haven't had a chance to get around to it, what with everything. Thanks for letting me know, I smiled at her. I thought you must have blamed the funeral home somehow, since you had the funeral somewhere else. Mr. Dunn called me and offered me quite a good rate, Donna said with a shrug. She handed me a cup of coffee. I took a sip. It was disgusting. Instant coffee is against my religion. I understand, I said. It would have been hard to be in the place where he'd been killed. Donna sipped her coffee and appeared to be lost in thought. Tears swam in her eyes. She reached up to touch her hair and her fingers touched the clump of grass. You should have told me, she said in alarm. I didn't want to embarrass you, I said lamely. Things like that often happen to me in the garden. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth, but I wondered what was going through Donna's mind as her eyes widened. You know, Preston and I were thinking of divorce, she said. Oh? Donna nodded. We fought about money. About money? I asked, surprised. This house is beautiful. It is. Oh, believe me, we had money, but it was all gone. Preston was spending it faster than he could make it. I suppose that sounds horrible. I've never worked, you see. Preston didn't want me to, but in the last few years, he sank so much money into his little project. Donna was looking up at the ceiling, so I took the opportunity to tip my coffee into the dead maiden hair fern sitting next to me in a fancy ceramic pot on the countertop. I wondered if it had been killed by other guests pouring their bad coffee into it. What was his little project? I asked. An album. At his age, he was recording an album. He hired a producer and bought time in a studio. All that's so expensive. He was sinking us, I thought for a moment. But now without him, there's nothing coming in. You'll have to work now, won't you? Perhaps, she said, sipping from her cup before she smiled. It was a predatory smile. Between you and me, there's a pretty big sum of money coming from Preston's life insurance. It will be enough to set me up for the rest of my life. I nodded and set down the empty cup. I really should be going, I said as I stood. Thanks for the coffee. Again, I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. Donna hadn't stopped smiling since she had mentioned the insurance money. I hurried out to my car and drove down the road for some way before pulling off at a lonely gas station. I sat in my car and thought about what I'd heard. Donna and Cameron were having an affair. Preston Kerr had spent all their money. The insurance money was certainly a motive. In this case, divorce would not have been easier. Donna wouldn't have been able to get anything from Preston in a settlement because there was nothing to get. I pulled back onto the road and headed for home. I had a new favourite suspect. My only reservation was that the police would have this information but had not acted on it. Chapter 16 it was Friday evening. It had been a long day. I had spent hours cleaning out the gutters at both the funeral home and mum's house, and as a result, I was covered with leaves and dirt. After the gutters had been cleaned, there were 50 more things to do. By the time I finally walked into the house, all I wanted to do was take a nice, relaxing bath. My mother, as usual, had other plans. Hurry up, Laurel! She snapped as soon as I walked in the door. Dinner's almost ready. We're having guests. I sighed. I didn't know you were having guests. 
we are having guests, she barked at me, waving a long silver spoon in the air. I told you that. Don't pretend you didn't know. I actually didn't know, Mum. Mum snorted with disgust. Hurry up and get ready. Who's coming? I asked with some trepidation. Not John Jones. Ian, of course, Mum said. I should have known that Ian was coming. I saw him so much that I wouldn't be surprised if he had moved into the spare room. So John Jones isn't coming? Mum shook her head. I already told you that, Laurel. Weren't you listening? John Jones is already here. He's in the kitchen, praying and thinking over the food. I clutched at my head. I thought I was going to be sick. I made my way slowly to the stairs when Mum spoke again. Basil Sandalwood is coming too. I froze in horror and my heart raced. Basil? Why would Mum invite Basil to her home? Basil? I stammered. Here? To this house? Here? Yes? Mum was quite smug, a fact which worried me. When she had that look on her face, she was always up to something. Something bad. Really bad. I hurried upstairs. Instead of a nice, relaxing bath, I had a rushed shower. This was going to be uncomfortable. Basil and I had parted in an awkward manner. Then there was the fact that Basil and I were the only people who had ever set foot in Mum's home who didn't attend her church. And then there was the fact that Mum probably intended to fire Basil with Ian's support. The fact that she couldn't do so would in no way stop her from trying. Whichever way I looked at it, this night was going to be a disaster. I was walking down the stairs when the doorbell rang. I sighed. Here begins a night of embarrassment, I thought. I hesitated, hoping Mum would answer the door, but she did not. I crossed to the door and opened it. Hi, Basil, come in. I tried not to meet his gaze. I looked past him and saw Ian parking in the drive that ran alongside the funeral home. I shut the door as Ian was climbing out of his car. Basil appeared to be tense as well. Before either of us could say any more, Mum appeared. Mr. Sandalwood, please come in. Laurel, you can wait there for Ian. Ian knocked only a moment later. Didn't you see me? He asked as soon as I answered the door. Yes, I said simply. I turned to walk to the dining room. Mum and John Jones had already set hot food on the table. When John Jones saw me, he hurried over to me and puckered up his lips. I ducked and hurried around to the other side of the table. Mum introduced Basil to John Jones and Ian. To my dismay, she introduced John Jones as my date. He is not my date, Mum, I said angrily. Ian, John, and Mum all gasped. I thought I detected a flicker of amusement pass across Basil's face. Mum pretended to cry and rushed out of the room. See what you've done, Laurel, Ian said. Your poor mother. How could you treat her like that? John Jones nodded his agreement, but stopped when I shot him a furious glare. I wondered whether to run out the door. In fact, I would have left, only I couldn't leave Basil there alone. Who knows what they'd say to him. As soon as we all sat down, Mum poked her head around the door. We need to say grace, she announced. Ian or John will say it, as they are the men. I wondered what Basil was, if not a man. I was already mortified, and I knew it would get worse. I was only grateful for the fact that I was sitting opposite Basil, so I didn't have to hold his hand while Ian said grace. I did have to hold John's hand, but for once I thought that the lesser of two evils. By the time Ian had finished saying grace and praying for all the misguided heathens and the person who was possessed by the demon alcohol, no prizes for guessing who that was, I thought the food would have gone cold. Mum wasted no time in saying what was on her mind. Basil, I don't think it's appropriate that you work for us anymore. Ian and I have been talking about it and it's simply not appropriate. Ian and you have been talking about it, I said in a cold voice. Well, Ian has nothing to do with the funeral home, nor do you for that matter. It is my funeral home. 
It is my business and no one else has any say in it. Mum appeared unperturbed. Basil does not go to my church, she said smugly. I'm sorry, Ian and I have been talking and that's our decision. I couldn't believe my ears. You've been talking, your decision. Let me repeat this and I'm going to say it slowly so it sinks in. Ian doesn't work for me. Ian doesn't get to decide anything. And for that matter, neither do you. You work for me, Mum. And to be honest, I'm likely to fire you long before I'll get rid of Basil. My mother looked at me with an open mouth. Ian put his hand over his heart in the most feigned display of surprise I'd ever seen. Basil seemed to be amused by the scene. I was no longer embarrassed. Rather, I was furious. Or to use an expression of my mother's, I was livid with rage. It's nothing against you, Mr. Sandalwood, Ian said. It's just that Thelma is concerned because Laurel is new age. I'm sure you can see that with Laurel running the funeral home and being new age, we're worried that you are a heathen as well. Surely you can see our concerns. No, Basil said flatly. He turned to me. Your new age. I shrugged. Apparently so. I have scented candles and crystals in my room. Crystals? John Jones gasped. They are tools of the D-word himself. The D-word? I asked. This was a new one on me. I don't glorify the D-word by saying his name out loud, John said in the most sanctimonious tone imaginable. And crystals are his tools. But crystals come from the ground, I said. Didn't God make them? Isn't that what you said, Mum, that God made the earth and everything in it? Mum was flustered for a moment. You always twist my words, Laurel, you little brat. Of course God didn't make crystals. John and Ian nodded. That floored me. I had no idea how to respond, so I just shoveled food into my mouth. You don't share your mother's views, Basil asked me. I signalled that I had food in my mouth and then tried to swallow it quickly. That only succeeded in making me choke. John Jones leaped to his feet and placed both his hands on my back. Please don't touch me, I said after I managed to swallow the food. I was praying for you, he said in an offended tone. You didn't need to touch me for that, I protested. Oh, yes, he did, Mum said as quick as a flash. When you pray for healing, you have to place your hands on the affected part. Ian and John murmured their agreement. But what if someone has hemorrhoids? I said without thinking. I mean, it sounded logical to me, and I wasn't prepared for the reaction. Laurel, Mum said loudly, I will not have such words used at my table. Ian and John Jones gasped in unison and covered their mouths with their hands. I ignored them and turned to Basil. No, I said firmly, I do not share my mother's views. I do not share Ian's views or John's views for that matter. I glared at the three of them in turn. And mum, is this why you invited Basil for dinner, to try to fire him? I turned back to Basil. I'm sorry about this. Basil lifted his hands, a gesture either of helplessness or sympathy. I had no idea which. Mum scowled at me. Why do you always twist my words? She used her whining voice, the one she used to gain sympathy. You can see what she's doing, can't you, Ian? Ian shot me a glare. I certainly can. He turned back to my mother. I don't know how you've survived all these years with a child like that. I took a deep breath and held my head in my hands. I couldn't have been more embarrassed. Whatever would Basil think of me now? Mum made a big show of dabbing at fake tears with the tissue. Laurel, I simply told Basil that I wasn't happy with him. I thought inviting him to dinner would be a nice way to fire him. Mum, I've said it before and I'll say it again, I said loudly. Who I employ is my decision, not yours, and definitely not Ian's. I don't care to hear John's views at any time. And that's the end of the conversation.
I slammed my open hand down on the table as hard as I could. It hurt like hell. I placed it back under the table and gritted my teeth. Showing my pain would spoil the moment. Mum, Ian and John stared at me with their mouths agape. I looked straight into my mother's face and said, and they had better be dessert. Chapter 17 It was a humid day. Humidity was unusual for the mountainous region of New England, Australia. The heat here was normally dry, but thunderstorms were invariably preceded by hours of humidity. The storm was building, the thick black clouds looked angry, and still the sun beat down relentlessly. The air all but crackled with electricity. I had trouble finding somewhere to park and had to drive around the block three times. Finally, I managed to wedge my car into a small space. I just hate it when drivers take up two parking spaces. I texted Tara, almost there. I was looking forward to telling Tara all about the insidious dinner of the previous night. In fact, telling Tara my problems was like therapy, only free. I arrived at the cafe's al fresco area and looked for Tara. I didn't see her in the first sweep. In front of me was a woman holding a sandwich in both hands. She reminded me of a possum, the way she was hunched over and nibbling her prize, as if a bigger possum would swoop in and steal it at any moment. Next to her were a young man and a young woman. Both were dressed very nicely for lunch, but were oblivious to one another. I figured they were on a date, but they were busy texting. Perhaps they were texting each other. Laurel, there you are, Tara called out. Over here. I made my way past the crowded tables to Tara. To my dismay, Janet was with her. It's so crowded here today, I said as I sat down. Perhaps next time we could try that new health food cafe. Janet snorted rudely. Health food? Green smoothies break me right out in strange places. Have you ever had a rash on your... The new healthy cafe would be great, Tara interrupted shrilly. She had clearly had enough of Janet's straight talking. Anyway, Laurel, I ordered you a latte when you texted me, but I didn't know what you wanted to eat. Janet poked my arm. A celery stick, most likely. She snorted so loudly that other patrons turned to look. Laurel's a human rabbit. We've got to get some protein into her. That whole lettuce and tofu thing just isn't natural. I looked at the half-eaten burger on Janet's plate. A charred beef patty, a fried egg, oozing cheese or some other yellow substance, bacon poking out the sides, not to mention all the fried onion rings. Janet's lunch was as far from natural as it got. I could almost hear the cholesterol sloshing around in her veins. Still. I dared not comment, as I knew only too well what fried foods did to Janet. She was quite outspoken about it. I did not want to hear about it again. Janet stood up abruptly. I have to go, this is getting boring. When Janet left, Tara slumped in her chair and sighed deeply. What happened? You don't want to know, Tara said. Anyway, tell me in detail everything that happened between you and the mysterious weirdo, Basil. She leant forward expectantly. He's not a weirdo, I said. When Tara raised her eyebrows, I added, okay, he's a little strange. Tara grinned. You two must have made up if you're defending him. Did he dump the Wicked Witch of the tabloids and proclaim his undying love for you? I snorted rudely. Hardly. So nothing's changed. Tara slumped in her seat, her disappointment obvious. So what could have happened at the dinner that you couldn't talk about over the phone? At the mention of that dinner, my heart beat rapidly. Soy latte, a voice said behind me. I jumped. The waitress placed the latte in front of me while Tara raised her eyebrows. You're so jumpy today. Was dinner that bad? I shook my head. Much worse. I took a sip of the latte. It was as weak as dishwater, but as Tara had bought it for me, I could hardly comment. I only came to this cafe when Tara invited me. Their coffee was always bland, 
and their food wasn't much better. I didn't want to call you to tell you because I went to bed as soon as Basil left. John Jones and Ian were still there. I wouldn't put it past any of them to listen outside my door. Plus, there was too much to text. That's why I said we should meet for coffee. Tara giggled. John Jones, your future husband. That's not funny. I pulled a face. He's unbearable. He's almost as bad as mum. I really need to get that apartment over the funeral home renovated and move in. I have got to get out of mum's house. Why haven't you started renovating it yet? I rubbed my temples. I've been consumed with the business. Don't forget the business wasn't in a good state when I took it over, so I've had to build it up. Plus, as soon as I got back, I had to get my head around the fact that I'd inherited the business, and then there was Tiffany's murder, and now there's Preston Kerr's murder. I've been so busy that I haven't had any time to think. The waitress came back, pen and paper in hand, ready to take my order. Nothing to eat, thanks, I said. When she left, I added, after last night, I've lost my appetite. Tara nodded. Is there much to do in the apartment? I groaned. Dad used it as a storage area for years, so it needs cleaning out. It has a ghastly old-fashioned bright orange bathroom with those hideous 60s tiles. You know the orange tiles with yellow concentric circles drawn on them? When Tara nodded, I pressed on. The kitchen is tiny and has laminate countertops, but it's okay, I guess. The plumbing isn't connected, so I'd have to get a plumber. The apartment was half built when Dad bought the funeral home, and it was never finished. I wasn't born then. Tara tapped her chin with a finger. Why don't you ask Basil if you can claim it as a tax deduction? Good idea, I chuckled. Is that your way of bringing the subject back to Basil? Tara laughed. Well, no, and yes. You still haven't told me what happened. It was a nightmare dinner with Mum, Ian and John. Like I texted you last night, Mum invited Basil over to try to fire him. Can you believe that? The nerve of her. I put my foot down and Ian and John were shocked. Mum was too. I laughed, remembering the looks on their faces. Tara laughed too. I wish I'd been there to see you tell off your mum. She wasn't going to say anything to me for the rest of the night, but I bet she said plenty after I went to bed. Gosh, it's so hot. I picked up a napkin and fanned myself. Tara followed suit. I thought there'd be a breeze with the storm coming. Anyway, get to the point, Basil. I scratched my neck where a mosquito had just bitten me. He was tense at first, but he did seem happy that I don't share mum's views. I wonder if he thought, my voice trailed away, that you would try to convert him with every breath, Tara filled in, looking sceptical. If he hasn't figured out that you're nothing like Thelma by now, then he's a pretty hopeless cause. I don't know. Tara chewed on her bottom lip thoughtfully. Come to think of it, I think his ex fiance was fairly religious. Don't quote me, though. It wasn't like I hung out with her crowd. He keeps to himself, pretty much. Maybe he's into something that he thinks you'll frown upon. Like what? I asked. Tara shrugged. I'd be happy for you if it worked out, Laurel, but don't get your hopes up too high. If I knew why his fiance stormed off the way she did, maybe I could offer better encouragement than that. But just deal with this with eyes wide open, okay? I don't want you to get crushed by those mood swings of his again. I wouldn't call them mood swings, I began, but Tara cut me off. No, but it sounds nicer than multiple personalities. I doubt you could compete with voices in his head. Her tone was light, but I knew she was serious. Relax and take it a day at a time. If he really likes you, he'll spell it out eventually. How long is eventually? Tara fanned herself again. Who knows? Men are hard enough to read at the best of times. But what I'd really like to talk about is how you put your foot down on your mum. As I recounted the events to Tara, my mind was still on Basil. It didn't sound like much when I told Tara, 
but there was something about the way he had looked at me when he asked me if I shared Mum's views. And what was up with him and Anna? Were they really dating? I did not want to think of the possibility that they were having any sort of relationship. At the same time, part of me wanted to wash my hands of the whole thing. I didn't know what to think. I knew there'd been something with Basil, one-sided or not. I hoped there was still something there now, hidden under the confusion and polite distance. Yet what it was, I had no idea. Did I want to know the answer? Or would the answer be worse than the wondering? Tara was concentrating on her food, and as I wasn't eating, I turned my thoughts once more to Preston Kerr's murder. There were two possibilities. Preston's ghost himself had told me that he had overheard the murderer speaking to Alec Mason's corpse, admitting to his murder. It was therefore likely that the murderer of Alec Mason and the murderer of Preston Kerr were one and the same person. The only caveat was that Preston Kerr's wife, Donna, had a solid motive for killing her husband. I did not think she had the physical strength to strangle anyone, but she was having an affair with Preston's brother. Preston was the most insubstantial ghost I had ever met, always fading in and out, and his trauma could be explained by him being in denial that his own brother had killed him. I shook my head. My stomach was rumbling constantly. I had the shakes from caffeine overload, and my head was spinning. I looked up to see Tara speaking into her mobile phone. I'd been so lost in thought that I hadn't even noticed it ring. Gotta run. Sorry, Laurel, she said. Duncan needs the car. Call me later? I nodded and followed her out of the cafe. Just as I stepped out on the sidewalk, the storm arrived with a vengeance. I sprinted for the car and tripped on the roadside. I managed to right myself before falling completely over, unlocked the car and dived in. I was drenched. I turned on the wipers, only to see something stuck under one of them. I jumped out into the driving rain, grabbed the envelope and dived back into my seat. It was a parking ticket for not being within the designated lines of the parking spot. How could I park in them? I yelled. That idiot behind me parked across two spots. That's terrible, a voice said beside me. I shrieked with alarm. I turned to see Preston Kerr. I would never get used to ghosts suddenly materializing. Luckily, no one outside the car had seen me yelling, as no one in their right mind was out in the storm. Hi, Preston, I said, starting the engine. I needed to get home in case hail was on its way. Thunderstorms in this district often brought heavy hail large enough to put dents in a car. I carefully pulled out onto the road. I had the wipers set to maximum, but visibility was poor. I found out about my wife, he said simply. Preston, I started, but I didn't know what to say. I was a jewellery valuer by profession, not a psychologist. Did you know? He asked. Yes, I found out recently. I'm sorry. I swerved to avoid a driver who had pulled out in front of me. I think I already knew, deep down, Preston said sadly. I finally found out how to go over to my old home. I saw my brother there. I'm sorry, I said. It's not right what they were doing. That's life he said. Sometimes it doesn't go your way. Well, I guess I don't get to say that anymore, do I? That was life for me. At any rate, I don't think I care as much as I would have if I were alive. I don't know if this is any consolation, I said, but I don't think this will bother you at all once you cross over. You're right, he said. It won't matter at all. Ernie is really getting on my nerves, and that's another reason I hope I cross over soon. I shot him a glance, but he had vanished. I really had to find his murderer for his sake and for the sake of my business. It was time to focus on the mayor. Chapter 18 I needed a reason to speak with the mayor, and I had a good one. 
I was a registered jewellery valuer. The mayor's family heirloom jewellery had been stolen. That was an in right there. I wanted to see if his anger over the theft was enough to give him a motive for murdering Alec Mason. I'd like to make an appointment with the mayor, I said to the abrupt woman on the other end of the phone. Regarding what? She asked curtly. Jewellery, I said. Jewellery, came the woman's snarky reply. Today at four. I was surprised that it was that easy. Yes, thanks, I said. She hung up. All right then, thanks so much, I said sarcastically to thin air. At ten minutes before four, I was sitting in a small waiting room outside the mayor's office. The woman I had spoken to on the phone sat at a small desk behind a glass screen. When I had announced myself, she had nodded, but not looked at me. Four came and went, and then so did 4.30, and the door to the mayor's office hadn't opened once. At 4.43 it finally did, and the mayor appeared. He was a short man, with hair exactly like Donald Trump's. It was the precise style and the precise colour. The fact that he was so short was a good thing, because everyone, even short people, could see more of his amazing head of hair. He wore thin framed glasses that glinted gold in the bright, artificial light. He came forward and shook my hand, and then ushered me into his office. I was still staring at his hair. Ms. Laurel Bay, he said with a slimy smile. The mayor nodded to a plush green leather chair and indicated that I should sit in it. He took his place in a much taller chair behind his large oak desk. The walls were lined with bookcases crammed with old books that didn't look as if they had ever been touched, or for that matter, dusted. So you wish to speak about jewellery, he said. I nodded. I own Witchwood's funeral home, the mayor nodded. I was so sorry to hear about your father, he said. We actually had my mother's service with him three years ago, and he really went out of his way for me. He sneered at me. Of course, when you're the mayor, everyone goes out of the way for you. It's a perk of the job. I forced a laugh. I'm intrigued. Please tell me what you mean when you say you want to talk jewellery with me, he continued. Your wife came over to my mother's house for dinner recently, the mayor nodded. She was excited to get out for a change instead of waiting for me at home and I got to stop and pick up a hamburger for dinner without feeling too bad about it, so we both thank you. She's always on me about my bad eating habits. I smiled again. The mayor was really working me over, trying to be a likeable and charming person. I could just see him kissing babies for newspaper photos. She told us about your mother's stolen jewellery, I said. His mood at once darkened. His eyes narrowed and his nostrils flared. That man, he said with a shake of his head. I nodded. I did Alec Mason's funeral. The mayor looked at me for a moment. Did you know he was a criminal? Yes, and I know he was murdered. The mayor frowned. I am sure people in organised crime don't last long. He stole from people who worked hard for what they have. I can never replace what he stole from me. It had sentimental value, you understand. It wasn't about the money. Your wife is quite upset about the whole thing. The mayor nodded. I wondered if he knew that wasn't true. She hadn't liked her mother-in-law, and so she didn't much care for the woman's jewellery. At least, if she was telling the truth. I'm a registered jewellery valuer, I said. I'd still be working as a valuer now in Melbourne if I hadn't inherited the funeral home. I thought I could help you. How so? The mayor asked me. If you would send me the insurance photos of the missing items, I can send them to all my contacts. I realised that the police would have put them in a database already. I know it's a long shot, but I do have good contacts in the business for high-end jewellery. The mayor nodded. Thank you. If you'll give me your email address, I'll email you the photos. That would be great. The mayor opened a desk drawer and pulled out some photos. These aren't insurance photos, of course, but at least you can get an idea of the jewellery. There's the necklace, 
he held up a photo of an elegantly dressed elderly woman in an evening gown. Mum at her wedding anniversary at the Park Hyatt in Sydney. That was five years ago, the year before Dad died. Mum was one of the hunters, you know. I didn't know. The hunters were one of the wealthiest mining families in Australia. The mayor bent over the desk and dropped the photos in front of me. I stared at the photos, my reason for being here forgotten for the moment. Sure, I didn't have my ten times lens, but I could tell the quality of the jewellery from the photos. The ring had a huge pear-shaped yellow diamond in the centre, surrounded by white diamonds. To colour grade the white diamonds properly, I would normally need comparison stones and have them unset. But just by looking at them, I could see that the colour was better than a G. Despite the fact that pear-shaped diamonds are worth less than round, brilliant cuts, it was nevertheless obvious that this stone was unique and very costly. It would be easy to identify once it was found. There couldn't be too many stones around like that. I estimated the size to be around seven carats, perhaps even more, depending how deeply the stone had been cut. If the coloured diamond had a certificate from the Argyle Mines in Australia stating that they'd been mined there, the values would be greater. Better diamonds are often laser inscribed on the girdle with a number for identification, and this made them traceable. Why hadn't the stolen jewellery come to light? I could only assume it had never hit the market. That meant that one or more people in the gang were holding on to the pieces, perhaps for their wives or girlfriends. I peered at the photos once more. The earrings looked to be yellow and white gold, with cushion-cut yellow and white diamonds. They were probably worth more than $20,000, as was the yellow and white diamond ring. When I saw the photo of the tennis bracelet, I gasped. The diamonds were enormous and unusual asher cuts. If the setting was platinum, the bracelet alone would be worth around a quarter of a million dollars. I looked back up at the mayor. Wow, I said, this would be worth a small fortune. He nodded. Yes, but it's not the money, it's the sentimental value. This jewellery had been in my mother's family for years. They were my mother's favourite pieces. His face went bright red and his cheeks puffed. He loosened his tie. For a moment, I was afraid he was going to have a heart attack or a stroke. Had he killed Alec Mason and then killed Preston Kerr? I had no idea. He did harbour a lot of resentment towards Alec Mason, but that was surely to be expected, given the circumstances. The mayor appeared to be nice enough and normal, apart from his hair, but then I supposed all killers appeared to be normal, at least to some degree. At a stretch, I could perhaps see him stealing a car to hit Alec Mason, but would he go so far as to strangle an innocent man to cover his tracks? Chapter 19 I was surprised to see a pickup truck parked in the driveway of Mum's house. It was white, with big silver splotches where the paint had worn away. It looked like something someone would buy for 200 bucks. Even more surprising, there was a ladder at the side of Mum's house, and there was a man on the roof. I walked into the funeral home and found Mum leaning against the office door. The office is locked, Laurel, she said. How could you be so hurtful? Why didn't you give me a key when you changed the lock? I ignored her questions. Who is on your roof? I said. My mother smiled in a rather sanctimonious fashion. Terence Bailey. Who is he? I said. Does he go to your church? I have no idea why I asked the latter, as I already knew the answer. Of course he does. Mum put her best pious look on her face. He was trying to find God. I didn't know God was missing. I said with a snicker. Mum was furious. God does not approve of jokes. And let me tell you, Laurel, Terence was a crimson sheep who had gone astray. He had turned each to his own way, but now he is back with the flock. I scratched my head. The whole sheep thing was confusing, as was her syntax. 
Mum continued more loudly. He found God while he was in prison. He's a changed man. Prison? I said with alarm. Mum raised her hands to the ceiling. Terence dearly wanted to be at Alec Mason's funeral, but he was still in prison. But now he's out. Now I was really worried. Mum, was Terence in Alec Mason's organized crime gang? Mum pursed her lips and shot me a cold glare. He was, but he has repented. All his sins have been washed white as snow. You know how compassionate I am. I thought hiring him was the right thing to do. I shrugged. Okay, but he's not allowed near the funeral home. Mum hurried towards the front door, muttering to herself. I caught the words, ungrateful, and little brat. I went into my office and checked my messages. There were none. I really had to do something to drum up business. I sighed and left, being careful to lock the office door behind me. Terence Bailey was down the ladder when I got to the house. He looked tough, but I wondered if that was simply because I knew what he had done to make a living most of his life. Really, he was just a man in his sixties with a tired-looking face. He didn't need to be up on the roof in the hot sun. Miss Bay, he said. Laurel is fine, I said with a smile. I suppose your mother has told you about my criminal past, Terence said. But now I'm a blessed man. Blessed, I tell you, not lucky. Being lucky is not of God, but being blessed sure is. Praise be. Call me cynical, but it seemed to me to be an act. I don't go to mum's church, I said dryly. I'm a heathen. Terence gave me an appraising look and then curled his lips into a thin, mean smile. Trouble finds me wherever I go. Big trouble finally caught up with Alec Mason. But I'm different now, so trouble is going to be leaving me alone. I, in turn, summed him up and decided to be up front. I had nothing to lose. Terence, the funeral business has been going downhill since Preston Kerr was murdered at Alec's funeral. Obviously, the two deaths must be related somehow. Do you have any idea who killed Alec Mason? Terence thought for a moment. You mean whoever killed Alec killed this Preston guy? Before I could respond, he continued. But he was a singer, so it doesn't seem like he would run in the same circles as Alec. I shook my head. No, I don't mean that. The police obviously thought that Alec's killer would attend the funeral, so what if his killer killed Preston too? It really is the only likely explanation. Terence looked skeptical. What motive would they have? I shrugged. Who knows? But surely there can't have been two murderers, and the cops don't seem to be making much progress. He grunted. And they likely won't. Alec Mason was involved with people who had ears and eyes and money in all the right places, and if they don't want to be found, they won't be. People die sometimes, and everyone might even know it's their doing, and nothing comes from it. I was surprised by his words. So you think someone killed Alec Mason and nothing will come of it? Terence leant forward. I know it. Terence, Laurel, my mother shrieked from the front door. Come in for a nice cup of tea. I walked inside the house with Terence and followed mum into the dining room. She had laid out her best silver and finest antique china. I noticed Terence's eyes light up. I'd have to keep a close watch on that man. Mum ignored me and gushed over Terence. Terence, she cooed, have some sponge cake. I made it myself. She cut a huge slice of the gooey cream-topped cake and deposited it on his plate. She continued to ignore me. Now, Terence, you are coming to the church working bee tomorrow. We're scrubbing that place from top to bottom. It will be a wonderful time of fellowship and hard labor. I wouldn't miss it for the world, Terence said. Praise be. Mum finally looked at me. Terence found God in prison, and so he was granted an early release. How wonderful is that? Good things come to good people. She narrowed her eyes at me, and I figured I wasn't counted amongst the good people. Praise be, Terence said for the umpteenth time. I nodded, resisting the urge to ask what God was doing in prison. 
That seemed a smart thing for Terence to figure out, a good ploy to get out of prison early. Of course, I kept my opinions to myself. Laurel, I left the chocolate cheesecake in the kitchen. I'm sure Terence would like some. Would you get it, please? I stood up at the same time that Terence spoke. Mrs. Bay, would you mind playing some of that lovely gospel music, please? Praise be. Do you have the hymn, Come Ye Sinners Poor and Needy? Mum jumped up. Yes, I'm sure I have that one, she said gleefully. I returned moments later with the cheesecake to see Terence stuffing a silver teaspoon in his pocket. When he caught my eye, he pulled it out of his pocket and polished it on his jeans. It was a bit dirty, I'm afraid, he said. Please don't tell your mother or she'll be embarrassed. Just don't do it again, I said pointedly. Terence met my gaze and held it, his stare guileless. The nerve of the man. I'd have to call Duncan later and give him the heads up. Soon the mournful drone of come ye sinners, poor and wretched, filled the house, dispersed with random interjections of praise be from Terence. I fought the urge to flee. I had to stay to ensure that Terence didn't rob the place, so I entertained myself by counting all the silverware and memorizing it. I wasn't looking forward to the conversation I would have with Mum later. I knew she wouldn't believe me, but I'd have to tell her nonetheless. And I would tell Duncan too. Chapter 20 God Almighty works in wondrous ways. It took a cleaning bee to get her hair, but my prodigal child is finally joining the flock. Mum crowed as she made her way down the aisle, waving handfuls of rags over her head like pom-poms. I ducked my head, my cheeks burning, as a scattering of strange voices took up the cheer. It was all I could do not to run right back out the door. I'm just here because Mum forgot her purse. I protested, the light dawning on me that Mum had deliberately forgotten her purse. I avoided the eyes of a dozen or so faces staring my way. While I wanted to set the record straight, I did not want to insult them by outright declaring that I had zero intention of returning. A kindly woman smiled encouragingly at me from over her thick bifocals. Of course, dear. You really should attend a service before you make a decision not to attend, though. We'd really love to have you. Our doors are always open. And I had been right about Mum's reaction. Mum had outright told me I was mistaken about Terence stealing her silverware. Duncan, thankfully, had taken the opposite viewpoint. Ian suddenly appeared at my side like a doleful spectre. Hello, dear, he said in a patronizing tone. I'm glad we finally got you to church. There's a Bible study tonight. We will see you there, won't we? No, I said, but you will see yourself stop calling me dear. I had to find Mum in a hurry and hand over her purse so that I could escape. Mum had beaten a hasty retreat after announcing to everyone that I was here and now was nowhere to be seen. I looked around once more and my eyes fell on Terence Bailey. He was peering at the silver candlesticks by the altar. I watched him for a few moments, and he didn't move. I supposed he was wondering how he could sneak them out. Oh, please, you are not that desperate, Janet's voice said from behind me. I know you're a little overweight, but you can do so much better. You just need to wear more makeup. I shook my head. No way, I whispered urgently. I'm just making sure... Janet interrupted me. That he doesn't steal anything, she said loudly. Terence looked up at us and took the candlestick out from under his coat. I'm just cleaning it, he said. He set it back in its place. He was fast. I hadn't even seen him take it. Come now, Janet. You're treating our guest like a criminal, Ian chided her. The good book says, judge not lest ye be judged. Yes, and it also talks about travelling blindly around ditches, Janet shot back. And that guy probably found more than a few ditches to dump people in. I prefer to travel with my eyes wide open, thank you. Finally, I caught sight of Mum. She was clapping her hands loudly. 
Ladies and gentlemen, of course, time for refreshments. She vanished out a door at the back of the room. I was swept along by the crowd into a large room, pristine white with speckled tan tile, filled with folding chairs and long tables covered in thin plastic tablecloths. The tables were laden with cakes. I had almost reached Mum when one of the ladies thrust a cupcake into my hands. It's so good to have you here with us. Your mother said you'd like one of these. I took the cake. Thank you. It emanated a heavy sweet scent of syrup and brown sugar, and it was covered with a scattering of some sort of shaved or crumbled reddish-brown confetti. There was another smell too, but it was so masked by the smell of the sweet that I could not quite make it out. I was staring at the odd colour of the icing when Janet reached out and took one from the plate. Oh my goodness, and I thought bacon couldn't get better. Laurel, you don't know what you're missing. Thank you, the woman said earnestly. It's my first time baking them. I found the recipe online. My mouth fell open. Bacon on a cupcake. Surely that went against the laws of nature. Cakes were for sprinkles and candied fruits or nuts, or a cream filling, but not bacon. That vegetarian thing is ruining you to new experiences, Janet said with a mouthful of bacon-laced frosting. No wonder you can't get a boyfriend. You're a vegetarian, the woman asked in alarm as she snatched the cupcake back from my hand. Thelma, why didn't you mention that your daughter is a vegetarian? It's just a phase she's going through, Mum said, waving her hand dismissively. Now was my opportunity. Here's your purse, Mum, I thrust it at her. Make sure nothing gets stolen out of it. Mum shot me a glare of disapproval. I turned away to see Terence stuffing cakes into his pockets at a rapid rate. I think some of the cutlery went in too. Just like a woman to get all in a knot over a little bit of nothing. The voice was familiar and a clammy hand landed on my shoulder and gave it an overly familiar rub. I knocked his hand off my shoulder. Touch me again and I'll have you arrested, I hissed in a low tone. I'm not joking. John Jones appeared unfazed. You ought to get used to a little meat. His tone was encouraging. You can't cook a man a good meal with carrot sticks and lettuce. Now what time can you be ready for me to take you out to dinner tomorrow night? It's not natural that you're not married and you run a business. There is no man to provide headship for you. Listen carefully, John Jones, I said firmly, all efforts to be quiet forgotten. I am not your date. I am not going anywhere with you, ever. You need to stop harassing me. John Jones gave a long-suffering sigh. Laurel, I know you're playing hard to get, but there comes a time when you need to settle down and find a man to take care of. I finally lost it. Listen to me, I said again, this time loudly. Keep away from me, John. Don't ever speak to me again. John looked at me with confusion. This is the strangest courtship I've ever been a part of, he said. Mum burst into shrieks. How could you? My only daughter making a public display of herself. She ran from the room, dabbing at her eyes in a dramatic fashion. Some of the ladies shot glares at me and ran after Mum. See what you've done? Ian said, your poor mother, having an ungrateful child like you. He turned to those still in the room, those not consoling my mother. It must be the demon alcohol talking. They all nodded sagely. Let me tell you it soon will be, I announced to all and sundry. I'm off to visit with my good friend, the demon alcohol, right now. Chapter 21 I sighed as I picked up my cup of green tea. I relished my quiet times alone. To my delight, Mum was at church. She had organised a prayer group to pray against Sharon Anderson's lust for Philip Baker. I wondered how that would play out, given that Sharon and Philip would be present, as would Philip's wife, Catherine. 
I bet Sharon Anderson was sorry she had ever confided in Mum. Just as I touched the tea to my lips, the doorbell sounded. Mum had asked Terence to install a musical doorbell that played the hymn Only a Sinner. I sighed and set down my tea, staring at the wisp of steam that wafted invitingly above it. At least Duncan had taken care of Terence. When Duncan had gone to the church cleaning bee to have a little chat with Terence, he found his pockets crammed with cakes and cutlery and his car filled with the church silver. Terence wouldn't be on Mum's roof again any time soon. I was halfway to the door when it rang again, to the words of boasting excluded, pride I abase. I opened the door to see John Jones standing there. Mum's not here, I snapped. But as soon as I said the words, I realized he knew only too well that Mum was at church. He held up a rose that was half smothered in grocery store cellophane. Good day, Laurel. I put my hands on my hips. What do you want? He frowned, glancing at the flower and back at me expectantly, as if I might somehow have missed it being shoved under my nose. Your mother said if I gave you flowers, you might go to dinner with me. He continued to hold out the flower to my face. This was all too much. John Jones, I will never go to dinner with you. Go away now, please. Don't make me get a restraining order on you. It's getting late and I have to feed the sheep. Sheep? John shot me an incredulous look. Well, I should take care of the sheep for you. You should be preparing dinner while a man works with the animals. I took a step closer to him. Stop right now, John, I said angrily. I just want to be left alone. There's not a snowball's chance in hell I will ever go to dinner with you. All hell would freeze over first. As soon as I said the word hell the first time, John Jones clamped both hands firmly over his mouth. He carefully laid the rose on the ground and then backed away as if he were dealing with a wild animal. I waited until I was sure he had driven away. No doubt my tea was now cold, so I decided to go and see the sheep. It was time to open the gate onto fresh pasture anyway. Arthur, Martha, first one here gets a treat, I called as I waved the rose in the air. I had no intention of taking the thing into the house. I opened the gate to the fresh pasture, which was green and lush with new grass. The sheep had already been eyeballing the field for the last couple of days. Arthur, Martha, I wondered where they were. They always ran over when they saw me. I'm sure they thought that my sole purpose in life was to feed them at every available opportunity. I finally saw them under the river oaks, and they were not alone. Basil was with them. Arthur and Martha were butting each other out of the way, vying for Basil's attention as he patted their heads. The sheep noticed me and came running. Basil laughed as he was promptly abandoned in favor of a woman with a fresh flower. Looks like they have a new favorite, Basil said, a hint of envy in his eyes as he watched the sheep stare up at me expectantly. Cupboard love, I'm afraid. I ripped the petals off the rose and gave shares to each of them. Sorry guys, that's all I've got today. I'd give you the stem, but I didn't have a chance to cut off the thorns. The sheep looked up at me with disgust. They waddled straight back to Basil, seeking out his hands and sniffing at his pockets to make sure he wasn't holding out on them. Basil chuckled. So you're buying them flowers now? I laughed. No, just sharing the overflow when my swarms of suitors shower me with more than I could possibly fit in the house. Basil patted Arthur's back. Thanks for having Arthur and Martha here. You're welcome, I said. Arthur and Martha are such sweeties, and they keep the paddocks trimmed nicely. He grinned. And dispose of the gifts from your rejected suitors. That too, I smiled at him. It could be worse, though. At least he didn't resort to clubbing me and dragging me back to his cave. That bad. I'm sure it's nothing a little pepper spray wouldn't fix. At once Basil's face was filled with concern. Well, be careful. Please keep on your guard. I'm fine, really. The pepper spray joke must have been a little too much. I'm just letting off a little steam. John Jones is extremely annoying, 
and that's an understatement, but I'm sure he's perfectly harmless. Basil shook his head and looked decidedly uncomfortable. I've had a feeling lately that you might be in some sort of danger. Look, I realize that sounds crazy. I hurried to reassure him. It doesn't sound crazy at all. I firmly believe in that sort of thing. Basil looked shocked. You do? I nodded. For sure. There's a lot out there that we can't prove. I'm very open-minded about visions, premonitions, you name it. I believe in tarot, all of that stuff. And I talk to ghosts, I added silently. Not that I could ever tell anybody that one. I'd find myself questioned about what the voices tell me to do and likely get a pretty pill to make them go away. Not that this stuff would work for my condition. You can't medicate a genetic gift of sight. They'd already tried that when I was a young child, thanks to my mother. Basil rubbed his chin. That's good to hear. It is? I said lamely. I wondered if Tara's passing theory was correct. Had Basil's ex fiance been fervently against the paranormal, and was that why he was now so wary? I've had premonitions since I was young. His voice was hesitant, and he avoided direct eye contact with me. It almost sounded as if he was confessing to doing something wrong. They've always come true. I wish I knew how to explain it without sounding entirely insane. It sounds perfectly normal to me, I said hurriedly. You're sure? Basil's expression was sceptical. Absolutely. You'd be surprised. I thought for a moment and then added, and a good friend of mine is a witch. Basil's mouth dropped open and I wondered if I'd gone too far. He stared at me for what seemed like forever before he spoke. And you approve? Of course I approve, I said with a shrug. Do you have a problem with it? Basil shook his head. Not at all. He scratched his chin some more. I'm glad you didn't react badly to me telling you that I have premonitions. I didn't want to tell you, but I couldn't think of another way to convince you to stay careful. Your word is good enough for me. I promise that I won't take any unnecessary risks. That's about all anyone can hope for, I suppose. Basil reached out and laid his hand gently on my shoulder. A crackle, like a small burst of electricity, ran through me, and I jumped. Basil snatched back his hand, whether from feeling the crackle or from my reaction, I couldn't tell. Just then, his phone rang. I'm expecting a call from a lawyer. I'll have to take it if it's him, he said, pulling the phone from his pocket. His tone sounded regretful, unless that was just wishful thinking on my part. He looked at the caller ID. Sorry, Laurel, it's him. I've got to take this. He answered the phone and hurried away, leaving me staring after him. Chapter 22 I peered at my list. Along the top of the paper, I had written suspects. Under that, I had written four names. Anna Stiles, Helen, the mayor's wife, the mayor himself, and Donna Kerr, with or without Preston's brother. My stomach rumbled loudly. I had not eaten that morning, unless you count three cups of coffee, and now I was on caffeine overdrive. I thought for a moment, tapping my pen on the desk. I decided I needed to narrow my list of suspects. I would start with Anna, since I had written her name down first. It was no secret that I disliked the woman. On top of that, she was clearly attracted to Basil. But still, I figured she was the least likely suspect. I wasn't even sure she really belonged on the list, but my dislike of her was going to force me to keep her there until I was certain. I called Tara. What's going on? Tara asked. I need to know something, I said. I was hoping you could help me. We only just spoke this morning. Is this a question you're asking me because my husband is a cop? Yes. There was a moment's silence before Tara spoke again. Are you going to end up attacked by another crazy person because of these questions? Maybe, I said truthfully. I hope not, though. I thought of Basil's premonition 
and shuddered. Tara groaned loudly. Okay, what do you need to know? Has Duncan said anything more about the connection between the murders of Alec Mason and Preston Kerr? He's been talking about the case, Tara said. He isn't too impressed with the two detectives who are leading on it. Why not? He says they seem willing to just take it all at face value. They think the first victim was killed by someone in his gang. Gee, that's pretty obvious. True, Tara said. And as I told you before, it was a stolen car with no DNA or fingerprints in it. Sorry, I don't have more for you. No, it's fine. I just wanted to see where the cops were at. After I hung up, I spent a few more minutes staring at my list. I kept ending up back on Anna's name. If I were going to start there, I needed to get a move on. Business was still bad after Preston Kerr's murder, and the call with Tara had only confirmed the fact that the police were no closer to an arrest. I wanted to eat before I left, but that meant going to Mum's house. My stomach rumbled again, so I drove to the healthy cafe. Soon I was in my car, guzzling down a green smoothie. It was a 30-minute drive to Anna's paper. I was nervous. What if she wasn't there? What if she was and refused to speak to me? It was a dilemma, but I had no choice. Business was going downhill, and no doubt would continue to do so until the police arrested someone for Preston Kerr's murder. I could not afford to wait around for that. By the time I walked into the building, I was in an irritable mood. The lobby was tired and worn, all shades of beige, grey and faded olive green. The only natural light came in through the crooked slats in ancient metal Venetian blinds covering a small window. A bored-looking receptionist was speaking with an angry customer who was yelling about her papers not being delivered. There was a closed glass door on my left, and a little closer was a curved staircase. I decided to bypass the receptionist and go up the stairs. I figured the journalists were up there. I was right. The creaky old staircase opened onto a long rectangular room filled down the left side with cubicles. To the right were desks with people working. I saw Anna at once. She was in the cubicle closest to me, her door open. A landline phone was held to her ear, pinched between her neck and her shoulder. She was typing on a laptop. When I knocked, her eyes widened in surprise. She held up a long, elegant finger, motioning me to wait. I walked into the room and sat down in the chair opposite her desk. I'm just waiting for someone to answer, she said, her hand over the mouthpiece. I could hardly see her behind her computer but I could certainly smell the peach perfume she was wearing. After a moment, she spoke into the phone. Anna Stiles here. I just need to know what Milton Fairchild went away for. Find out why he was arrested. She hung up and kept typing. Oh, you had to leave a message, I said with fake sympathy. Anna stopped typing and looked up at me. No, what do you mean he was there? I told him what I wanted to know. What are you doing here? I wanted to speak with you, I said. If you're going to keep stating the obvious, you'll have to leave, she snapped at me. I'm trying to find out who killed Preston Kerr. For once, emotion showed on her usually impassive face. You are? Why? I adjusted my position in the uncomfortable chair. Business has been down ever since he was murdered and the cops haven't arrested anyone yet. Anna leant back in her chair and crossed her long legs. What do you want from me? My stomach growled loudly. I ignored it and pushed on. I just thought you would have some information on Alec Mason and whether his death was connected in some way with Preston Kerr's. I thought if anyone had information, it would be you. Anna looked pleased. You're right. I was writing a piece on the jewellery crime ring before Alec Mason was murdered, even before he was released from prison. I knew he hadn't gone straight, like he claimed. You wouldn't know this, Laurel, she continued in a condescending tone. But you have to get your facts right when you write an expose, 
or your paper could get sued if your editor will even publish it in the first place. I was waiting for her to stop so I could say something, but she didn't give me the opportunity. She pressed on. I'll let you in on a little secret, Laurel. I'm not going to stay in this town. I want to sell my story to 60 Minutes or one of the big Sydney papers. Here I am writing about the brick-throwing contest at Stroud or the Wool Festival in Armadale, even the Land of the Beardies Festival at Glen Anna's. She made a horrible snorting sound. Let me tell you, when I break this story, I will leave that all behind. I'm going to move back to Sydney. I've already been looking at new places online. This thing is going to take off. I wonder who will play me in the movie version. I can only imagine, I said. How about Hugh Jackman? Anna narrowed her eyes. The mayor is my suspect in the murder of Alec Mason. You can see why I have to get all the facts before I make those allegations. She looked at me expectantly. I don't know anything about Alec Mason. The one I'm interested in is Preston Kerr, I said, and I have three suspects. Anna grinned a thin-lipped, mean smile. Let me guess. The mayor, his wife, and Donna Kerr? I nodded. I suspect Donna Kerr. I didn't really suspect Donna more than anyone else, but I wanted to see how Anna would react. It's hard to believe she would have her husband killed, though. Anna shook her head. To me, Preston Kerr is just some man. A strange footnote in my story, if he makes the cut at all. It angered me to hear Anna speaking so glibly about a man who had been murdered, but I wasn't about to comment. What makes you so sure it's the mayor? Anna looked at me for a long while. Intuition, she said. You can't make it as a reporter without it. I know who killed the man, and I need to have that information for my story. It was him. I just know it. I nodded and stood up. Well, best of luck with the story. Anna folded her arms. What did you really come here for? I thought you would be the easiest one to scratch off my suspect list, I said. Of course you'd suspect me, she said nastily. I shook my head. I didn't really. I just needed to eliminate people. So you don't think I did it? Anna asked. No, I said truthfully. Then I won't have to kill you after all, Anna said with a straight face. I forced a smile. Anna was irritating and smug, but she was clever, and she'd said she suspected the mayor. Anna stood up. The whole time she had been partially obscured by her huge, no doubt expensive, desktop computer. She moved around it towards me, and my eyes fell on her bracelet. I gasped and blinked when the fluorescent light caught the facets. Asher cuts. The luster of the claws indicated that the bracelet was platinum. Even with my naked eye, I could tell the large diamonds were F color or better and they don't cut stones that well if they aren't of superior clarity. I was looking at a 30-carat tennis bracelet. I figured the retail value was in the vicinity of a quarter of a million dollars, depending upon the jeweler's markup. Unfortunately, Anna had noted my interest. You like my bracelet? I took a deep breath and tried to act blasé. It's very pretty. Are those real diamonds? I said innocently. Yes, Anna said through narrowed eyes, a gift from an old boyfriend. I nodded and beat a hasty retreat. I was certain that the bracelet Anna was wearing was the mayor's highly expensive stolen one. Yet why would she wear it out in public? I suppose she thought she was safe to do so, and upon reflection, I figured she was right. I knew there were no jewellery valuers in her town, or in mine for that matter, and laypersons wouldn't have a clue of the value of the bracelet. And to the majority of people, one tennis bracelet would look like any other. I walked as fast as I could to my car. I sat inside the car and reached for my mobile phone to call the police. It was dead. I groaned. Of all the times. I headed straight for the police station in Witch Woods, 
My heart was thumping out of my chest. If Anna had the stolen bracelet, then somehow she had been involved with Alec Mason. There was even the possibility that she was his murderer. Chapter 23 To my dismay, the police station was closed. This was typical of small country towns, but that was no consolation. I pressed the buzzer next to the sign on the wall three times before someone answered. This is Laurel Bay. Is Duncan there? I asked urgently. The calm voice on the other end informed me that Duncan and Brian were both out on calls. I told the voice that I was sure Anna Stiles was wearing the stolen tennis bracelet and so was likely implicated in the murder of Alec Mason. The voice assured me that the message would be passed on. I had no option but to return to my office. I had advertised the celebrity funerals on Twitter and wanted to see how my click-through rate was going. I had no sooner turned on my laptop than the office door was flung open. Google. Anna Stiles was standing in the doorway. For a moment, it seemed like everything started to move in slow motion. My pulse pounded. There was a strange pressure in my ear as adrenaline began coursing through my veins. Somehow, once again, I had found myself face to face with someone I knew to be a murderer. Google, I repeated, trying to stay calm. I googled you, she said as she crossed the room. Jewelry valuer, eh? You were so surprised when you saw my bracelet. That wasn't very smart of you. I noticed she wasn't wearing it now. Yes, very expensive, I said. Your ex-boyfriend must have been very wealthy. Anna narrowed her eyes. I'm not stupid, you know, she said. I know you recognize the bracelet. I was at a loss. I couldn't think of a single thing to say. I clung to the hope that Duncan and Brian would get the message and would know I was at the funeral home. I only hoped they would get the message in time. You know, I'd rather not kill you if I didn't have to. I'm not a crazy person, Anna said, and then she laughed, exactly how a crazy person would. There's no way I'm going down for any of this. If anything, I'm the victim. Then why did you do it? I asked her. I needed to keep her talking as long as possible. You can't murder someone and then say you're a victim. Anna smirked and rolled her eyes. Oh, you want to know why I did it? I was working on my story about the jewellery thieves. Organised crime stories are the best. It was a good story and a good lead. I did some digging and it brought me to Alec Mason. I told him I knew everything and I wanted him to cut me into the deal or I would publish. But he wouldn't do it? I asked. He gave me the bracelet to shut me up and said we had a deal. He knew I really had it on him. I had everything. I had him, and I had names of the people he worked with. And even better, the people he worked for. I wanted a cut of the business, too. But he said no. No, he wouldn't cut me in. He thought I was just some girl who didn't know how it worked. And it cost him his life. I want you to know that he threatened me first. And, well, I hit him with the car. I planned it well. I was angry. But you killed Preston Kerr too? Anna nodded. I had to. I realized he heard me. He was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's hilarious that you thought his wife was the murderer. Pinning that crime on her is going to be easy. Everything just fits, doesn't it? The money problems, the affair. I couldn't have written it any better myself. This story will be my ticket out of these small town trappings. Do I look like a small town girl to you? I shook my head. All right, enough of this. Let's just get this done with. You were in the wrong place at the wrong time, just like that singer. 
You know, the best part about being a girl is that no one ever thinks a girl is strong enough to strangle someone. Never mind that I can bench press more than any cop in this town. She lunged across the desk at me in one smooth motion before I even had a chance to move. She clutched at my throat. Her fingers were strong with a vice-like grip. I threw myself backwards and her fingers loosened a fraction. I tried to pry her fingers from my throat, but they wouldn't budge. She knocked me to the ground and sat on me, her talons reaching for my throat once more. I dug my nails into the back of her hand. She yelped and released her grip momentarily. And then Ian appeared at the door. Chapter 24 Ian was holding a bunch of papers in his hand. Anna left me on the floor and lunged for Ian. He let out a high-pitched wail like a terrified pig, flung the papers at Anna, and sprinted in the other direction, screaming all the while. The papers hit Anna in the face. She must not have been able to see with them covering her face. In her pursuit of Ian, she ran headlong into the doorpost and at once crumpled to the ground. I gingerly picked myself up and went over to her. Religious tracts covered her. In fact, there was one covering her entire face. I peeled it off and was relieved to see that she was out cold. In my peripheral vision, I saw Ian creeping back. It's safe, Ian, I said. Laurel, are you awake? He asked. My eyes are open, Ian, I said. I'm kneeling, not lying down, so of course I'm awake. Oh, he said, I thought she'd knocked you out. I was spared having to reply as Duncan and Brian burst into the room. Laurel, are you okay? Duncan said. We heard a woman screaming repeatedly. That wasn't me, I said, nodding to Ian. Anna Stiles is the killer of both Alec Mason and Preston Kerr. I saw her wearing the mayor's stolen tennis bracelet earlier, and she saw that I recognized it, so she came to kill me, too. Anna was starting to regain consciousness. Duncan and Brian slapped handcuffs on her and dragged her away. Ian sat on a chair and fanned himself with one of the tracks. His face was white and ashen, and he was trembling. Thanks, Ian. I'm glad you came, I said sincerely. I was going door to door, handing out these gospel tracts to encourage people to come to church, he said. I picked one up and looked at it. It showed several people engulfed in flames with died in their sins stamped all over the drawing. Very encouraging, I said sarcastically. Ian nodded. What is wrong with you? A shrill voice screamed. This is the second time someone's tried to kill you. Mum, my throat hurts. I don't need you to blow out my eardrums too, I said grumpily. Duncan reappeared and poked his head around the door. Laurel and Ian, we'll need to take statements from both of you. You both look like you could use a break, so I'll come back after we process Miss Stiles. Mum took Ian by the arm. Come to the house for a nice cup of tea. You had a horrible shock. She looked at me over her shoulder. You too, Laurel. As soon as we got to the house, Mum took Ian into the kitchen. No doubt he needed to help her boil the jug. I went into the living room and leant back on the sofa. I was shaken. Ernie materialized in front of me. I jumped and would have squealed, only my throat was burning and raw. Preston Kerr crossed over just before you reached the house, he said. He didn't even say goodbye. Part of me was sad but I was happy for Preston. Ernie shrugged. He was no fun anyway. Well, didn't you have the exciting time? You were nearly buried in your work again. That's getting old, Ernie. You've used that pun at least three times in the last week. I pulled a face at him. At that moment, Mum walked in, followed by Ian. Laurel, don't pull a face. The wind might change and your face will be stuck like that forever. Mum hadn't said that to me since I was a child. Memories of my childhood, none of them good, came flooding back. I stood. Mum, I need to be alone. I'm going back to my office. Mum followed me, protesting loudly. 
Don't make me out to be the bad one like you always do, she called after me. I waved over my shoulder without looking around and kept walking. When I got to the funeral home, I bypassed my office and went straight to the kitchen. I pulled out a nice bottle of Margaret River Chardonnay. Of course, it was inside a large plastic container marked salad, which was the only way to stop mum from discovering it and pouring it down the drain. I went back to my office, locked the door behind me, and deposited some wine into my coffee mug. I looked around my office and smiled. I had come back home when my father died, with the intention of leaving as soon as I could. Instead, thanks to him leaving the funeral home to me, I was building a life here, and I didn't think I could be any happier, apart from the times when people tried to kill me, of course. Now the only test was seeing if I could go more than a month without finding myself embroiled in another murder mystery. It would certainly be worth a shot. When I was alone in my office, I often spoke to my father. I couldn't be sure he heard me, and he didn't speak back, but I talked to him just the same. When he had died, he had passed on, and I hadn't seen him since. But I didn't know why that meant I shouldn't talk to him anymore. Life here is crazy, Dad, I said. I thought he would have had a laugh about that. He had never almost been killed in the decades he had run the funeral home, and I had almost been killed twice in the short time since taking it over. I thought Mum would be the one to kill me, I added, and I could just picture him saying, you and me both. Have one for me, kid, Ernie said, hovering in front of me. You scared me again, I said. I nearly spilt it, Ernie huffed. Next time I appear, I'm going to yell boo. Then you'll really know what it is to get a fright. Please don't, I exclaimed. I've had a bad enough time as it is, what with that horrible reporter trying to kill me and Ian being over at Mum's. First thing tomorrow, I'm going to call a plumber to start on the apartment. I jabbed my finger towards the ceiling. Ernie floated over to me. You'll have to call that accountant to see if you'll get a tax break. He winked. I waved my hand at him. Ernie, stop floating. Why are you being so especially annoying? Ernie landed. I'm bored. I'll have no one to bother now that Preston's crushed. I shook my head. Honestly, Ernie, you're acting like a child. He was clearly offended. I was only coming to tell you that your accountant is on the way. He giggled like a schoolgirl and then vanished. I jumped to my feet. Basil, coming here? I looked at my coffee mug. Okay, I had only had a few mouthfuls of wine. Good, but what about my hair? I must look a fright, given that the muscle-bound Anna had flung me to the floor. A quick finger combing would have to do. There was a knock on the office door. My heart leaped and I hurried across the room. As I reached for the old brass doorknob, I paused. What if Ernie had been joking and it was John Jones? There was only one way to find out. I flung the door open, and to my relief, Basil was standing there, his face filled with concern. Basil, I said, come in. I turned to go back to my desk when Basil caught my arms and spun me around. The same electric jolt coursed through me, but this time Basil didn't let go. I heard what happened, he said. Are you all right? Yes, my voice came out unsteadily. After all, the hot accountant was only inches from me. I'm more shaken up than anything. Basil pulled me to him, but I resisted. Oh no, I said firmly. I'll be really angry if you kiss me again and then tell me we can never be together. Basil dropped my arms at once and his face flushed beet red. I'm so sorry about that, Laurel. I don't think that anymore. It's just that at that time I thought, well, that you might be like your mother. I gasped. I had never been so insulted in my entire life. I meant overly religious, Basil hastened to add. I had a bad breakup, and my fiancé was like your mum. Well, that made sense. That was true torture indeed. No wonder it had left him afraid of women. Nowhere near as bad as your mother, obviously, 
Basil continued, if you don't mind me saying so. I get the picture, I said with a smile. Basil pulled me back to him, and this time I didn't resist. He smelt divine, of cedar and wood smoke and lime. Our lips met, and I leant into his embrace. Boo, Ernie yelled as he materialized at our side. Basil and I both jumped and looked at Ernie, and then we looked at each other in shock. The End The next audiobook in this USA Today best-selling series is Make the Ghost of It. In Make the Ghost of It, Laurel Bay has discovered Basil's secret, but there are soon more important things on her mind. Louis Lowe's, an old friend of Basil's, is dying to go skydiving with him. Basil agrees, although he is up in the air about it. It soon turns out to be a grave mistake. When Lewis's parachutes don't open, he earns his place as the funeral home's next body. The police suspect murder, and their main suspect is Basil. Laurel buries herself in sifting through the clues. Can she solve the crime before she becomes the next victim? That's Make the Ghost of It. Book three in the Witchwoods Funeral Home series. You can find audiobooks by Morgana Best at morganabest.com. You've just listened to Nothing to Ghost About, book two in the Witchwoods Funeral Home series, written by Morgana Best, narrated by Amy Soakes. Text copyright 2015 by Morgana Best. Audio production copyright 2023 by Morgana Best. If you've enjoyed this audiobook, please consider leaving a review and recommending on social media or directly to friends and family. And you can find other audiobooks by Morgana Best at morganabest.com. Thanks for listening.